rate of dis persons with disability 2013 to 2022. This is the second day of the meeting and I now call the meeting to order. At this point in time, please allow me to invite the Secretariat, uh, Secretary to update us on some housekeeping matters. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's my pleasure. I've been reminded by, uh, by our host country, Indonesia, about this wonderful gala dinner that will be hosted by uh, Her Excellency, the Chair, uh, in, in, uh, at MOSA, and all delegates and all participants attending this meeting are cordially invited to attend the meeting this evening. And the buses will be leaving from at 6 p.m. from here, so please assemble at the Fairmont lobby from between 5.30 to 6 so that you make it to the venue on time, which has a rich, uh, rich cultural performance and wonderful cuisine of Indonesia, and which our hosts have taken great trouble in putting together. So this was just a gentle reminder to keep this on your calendar because this is going to be a wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, um, today we will focus on deliberations on agenda item three, forward-looking policies and strategies for disability inclusive development in Asia and the Pacific during the period to 2030, focusing on key and emerging regional issues and opportunities. I'd like to thank you all for your deliberations yesterday and your cooperation towards the success of day one of this meeting. The background documents to support the deliberations on this agenda item has been published on the meeting website, including two background documents, which reviews the implementation of the Asian and Pacific Decade of Persons with Disabilities from 2013 to 2022, and the implementation of the Incheon Strategy, respectively. You may also refer to the information paper, Escape APDDP 2020, which captures the perspectives of persons with disabilities, civil society organizations on the implementation of the decade. Under this agenda item, we will have four roundtable discussions. Concept notes of the roundtables have been published on the meeting website. Each roundtable will first have a moderated panel discussions, after which I will invite interventions from the floor. Excellencies and distinguished delegates, I now have the pleasure to open the first round table focusing on harmonization of national legislation with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability and invite Professor Andrew Bryans, uh, Emeritus Professor of International Law and Human Rights at the University of New South Wales to moderate this panel discussion. Professor Bryans is joining us online. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm privileged to have the opportunity to moderate this roundtable on the harmonization of national laws with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I'm joining you this morning from the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, one of Australia's First Nations. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Our panel this morning comprises a stellar lineup of persons with extensive experience and expertise in relation to the human rights of persons with disabilities and the convention at the international level and at the national level, both within the executive government and in the world of national human rights institutions. We have four panelists to whom I will pose two rounds of questions each. And to each of these questions, panelists will have up to five minutes to respond. This will be followed by reflections from our two commentators. Given our time constraints, I'll introduce our participants by name, country, and relevant position, though their experience and bios go well beyond that. As you know, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities has been an essential component of ESCAP's work in relation to the rights of persons with disabilities for many years, including during the drafting of the Convention. The Convention, of course, has an independent existence as an internationally legally binding instrument. But it's also been an important component of ESCAP's overall policy frameworks to advance the rights of persons with disabilities, most saliently in the Inchon strategy, which sets specific goals in relation to the convention and the harmonization of national law with it. As part of the final review process of this decade and the progress under the Inchon strategy, ESCAP initiated a project to assess the progress made in the harmonization of national laws with the convention and the challenges that still remain. 
Her project included the preparation of five country case studies and, over, and an overview. The overview has been published in time for this meeting and is available on the ESCAP website. The five country case studies will shortly appear. The findings of these reports and, uh, the, over, uh, and the review and earlier uh, analyses show that the countries of the Asian and Pacific region have overwhelmingly embraced the convention as a framework for legislative and policy development. Most countries in the region have adopted legislative reforms that have been stimulated by the ratification or impending ratification of the convention. And all but a handful of states in the ESCAP region are now party to the treaty. At the same time, the record of harmonization is mixed. Often amendments fall short of the standards of the convention as articulated by the Committee on the Rights of the Persons of Persons with Disabilities, three members of which we are fortunate to have with us today. There's no doubt that in all countries more needs to be done and effective structures put in place to ensure that this happens. Let me now turn to our panelists <coughs> and commentators and invite them to offer their reflections on the progress and achievements thus far, as well as on the difficulties and barriers that remain to the full harmonization of national laws with the convention. Our panelists in order of speaking are Ms. Myon Kim from the Republic of Korea, who's the Vice Chair of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Secondly, Mr. Rajesh Kumar Yadav from India, who's Joint Secretary of the Department of Empowerment of Persons with Disabilities in the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment. Thirdly, Ms. Risnawati Utami from Indonesia, is a member of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And finally, Ms. Frances Anderson, who's Senior Disability Rights Advisor at the New Zealand Human Rights Commission. The answers to the two rounds of questions to the panelists will then be followed by reflections from our two commentators. And our commentators are, firstly, Ms. Sawalak Tongkwe from Thailand, also a member of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and Mr. Moa Limin Abdi, Director General of the Indonesia uh, of Human Rights in the Indonesian Ministry of Law and Human Rights. So let's move next to our first round of questions. Uh, and I'd like to pose a question to Ms. Mion Kim. Uh, Ms. Kim, <clears throat> 16 years after the adoption of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, where are, are we in terms of implementing the Convention? How does the human rights model of disability envisioned by the Convention affect the legal reviews and reforms by states' parties? How has it changed legal systems in Asia and the Pacific? I remind you that you have up to five minutes uh, to respond to each question. Over to you, Ms. Kim. Thank you, uh, Mr. Andrew Bernis. Uh, good morning, uh, Excellencies, delegations, ladies and gentlemen. Selamat pagi. Uh, I'm Mi Young Kim uh, from uh, Republic of Korea, uh, the Vice Chair of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. It is a great honor to be here with you. I would like to thank you for inviting me, uh, especially uh, uh, to the Special uh, Social Development Division, ESCAP, to attend as a panelist at this uh, important momentum. I would like to special thanks to the Mr. Aiko Akiyama and Min Kyung Kim for organizing this wonderful round table. This week is a significant moment for the UN ASCAP, especially for the over the 700 million persons with disabilities in Asia Pacific region. We all know the unexpected COVID-19 pandemic, climate crisis, and natural disaster revealed that the actual situation of persons with disabilities is an issue for all humanity in these days. Now the case of disability has become a significant issue that cannot be neglected anymore. The human rights of disability issues begin to emerge in detail. This year is 16 years after the adoption of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So the question of where we are for implementing the convention is a crucial topic. For a long time, persons with disabilities were invisible citizens. They were segregated, isolated, and marginalized and were exposed to discrimination over the past few decades. But through the tireless effort of persons with disabilities themselves at national and global levels, the situation has changed since 
December 2006. After five years of negotiations, the United Nations General Assembly unanimously adopted the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and Optional Protocol. CELPD was the first human rights treaty in the 21st century and was also one of the fastest growing human rights treaties. Now it is the 186 state parties have ratified the convention and the optional protocol which allows submitting individual communications and initiating an inquiry into grave system violation of the convention has been approved or assist 100 state party to the convention. I would like to say about the, the originality, effectiveness, and authority of CLPD as an answer to the question of where we are for implementation, implementing the convention and how the human rights model of disability envisioned by the convention affect the legal view and reform of state parties. First, CLPD is a milestone in protecting the human rights of persons with disabilities. The purpose of the convention is to promote, protect, and ensure the whole and equal enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedom by all persons with disabilities and or first respect for their inherent dignity. Secondly, CLPD is uh, legally binding international human rights law as of pandemic strip two, by which the human rights model replaced the medical models. It recognized persons with disabilities as right holders entitled to participate fully in and contribute to society rather than being seen as the marginalized object of PT or charity, recipient of social welfare or a person's for whom others make every day and significant life decision as a matter of course. Suddenly, CLPD is the first international legally binding instrument to address the right of persons with disabilities globally. The convention set out the comprehensive legal and policy framework about the rights of persons with disabilities and the process needed to ensure that they enjoy these rights and the national levels. First, CLPD is only the international human rights law that has a concept of multiple discrimination to open the human rights door for those who, who face the multiple discrimination because of their backgrounds and minority in humankind history for the first time. Fifth, CLPD is the only international human rights law that emphasized the need to incorporate the gender perspective in all effort to promote the full enjoyment of human rights and fundamental freedom by persons with disabilities and strengthening the equality between men and women as a general principle of the convention. Sixth, CLPD is the only international human rights law that has the article and substance for women and girls with disabilities who are faced with gender-based discrimination. Seventh, CLPD changed the concept of disability. According to the framework E of the CLPD, disability is an involving concept. It means that disability results from the interaction between persons with impairments and attitudinal and environmental barriers that hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. CLPD expressed that person with disability, not a disability itself, but emphasized that they must respect their impairments as an inherent dignity as others. A, CLPD includes people with disability as a group among the diversity of society. State party must be later recognize the diversity of persons with disabilities and protect their diversity by law. It is most clear in the framework P of CLPD that the state party to the convention are concerned about different conditions faced by persons with disabilities who are subject to multiple or uh, aggravated form of of discrimination based on race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, etc. Ninth, CLPD has linked with all existing UN human rights norms, like the 
Charter of the United Nations and eight of the uh, UN Human Rights Treaty bodies enact before the CLPD. As a result, the right of the disturbed are starting to become mainstream to previous UN treaty bodies. I believe that the human rights of persons with disability will become the primary key to all international human rights laws. Hence, the human rights of persons with disability began to primate into UN agencies, UN organizations, international human rights area, international cooperation, and regional and national level policies. Disability issue began to be included in the UN General Assembly, the UN Economic and Social Council meeting, and humanitarian actions. Secondly, I think that the charge of the legal system in Asia and the Pacific means that recognize the power of CLPD by independent monitoring system. The human rights of persons with disabilities are gradually changing at the national level through the continuously independent monitoring system by the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the National Human Rights Commissions, and organizations of persons with disabilities. Now I'm 186 to to countries, we're, we're including eight minutes, so the Asia Pacific CLPD State Parties gathering here have voluntarily entered the convention implementations monitoring framework on their own. If state parties do not withdraw from their status as state party to the CLPD, it will be continuously forever. The convention established the monitoring framework by providing for an international supervisors group, the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Kindly requesting committee. you to conclude, ma'am. Yes, please. <laughs> it means that, um, yeah, I would like to finalize my uh, uh, speech. Uh, the new way of the Asia uh, Pacific region now faced the turning point to the obligation of implementation of CLPD by legally bind. State party letters by the CLPD in AP reason uh, now have a legal obligation to protect and guarantee the human rights and freedom of persons with disabilities. These responsibilities are fundamentally different from the Asia Pacific decade of disability declaration before. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kim. Uh, just to remind other speakers, please, we need to try and keep close to the five minutes, otherwise we won't get through all the uh, the questions and we're already uh, four minutes over. Okay, I'd now like to move to Mr. Rajesh Kumar Yadev uh, from India. Uh, and your questions, uh, Mr. Yadev, are, uh, We'd like to know the measures that the government of India has uh, taken to align its national legislation with the convention. And could you elaborate on the initiatives that uh, have yielded positive outcomes and indeed uh, issues where there uh, have been barriers or challenges? Over to you, Mr. Yadev. Good morning, Good morning. Uh, uh, Mr. Andrew. Uh, respected Madam Chair, our learned colleagues, and first of all, I want to thank uh, Inescape to choose me as a panelist today. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor, for asking this question. I want to uh, answer in a different manner. I want to take you to take you around 92 or 95. Uh, India enacted a law for empowerment and inclusion of persons with disabilities in year 1995. The name was the act was the Person with Disabilities, Equal Opportunities, Protection of Rights, and Full Participation Act 1995. This law was basically a welfare oriented for the person with disabilities to protect and promote their equality, rights, full participation, and to give effect to the proclamation adopted by United Nations Economic and Social Commission of Asia and the Pacific in 1992. Uh, after that, just after that, the Indian government has enacted the Rehabilitation Council of India Act 92. This act provides for a framework for recognition of educational courses for rehabilitation professionals and their registration. 
the government of india has also enacted the national trust for welfare of persons with autism cerebral palsy mental retardation and multiple disability act 1999 it provides for mechanism for special care initiatives for these classes of person with disabilities <laughs> who are considered to the most deprived and vulnerable categories of society in this national trust act right now we have more than 750 district level committees which are protecting the rights of these kind of disabled persons uh, these committees are empowered to give um, guardianship rights also and these committees are headed by district magistrates in our country india ratified united nations convention on right of person uncrpd on 1st of october 2007 i am happy to just uh, tell that india was among the few uh, countries immediately who ratified this uncrpd and one of the obligation under this uncrpd was to align domestic legislation with the convention accordingly with a view to harmonize pwd act 95 with the provisions of uncrpd an expert committee under the chairmanship of dr sudha call executive director indian institute of cerebral palsy a non governmental organization and comprising a representative from central ministries state government civil societies organization disability specific organization was constituted why i am i just want to um, mention here that because this committee was headed by not the government officer or government expert it was headed by an independent expert from a non governmental organization this committee suggested a new law namely the right of persons with disability bill to replace our old act pwd act 1995 the parliament passed the bill in december 2016 so we took around 6 7 years to deliberate this law we know the country is very vast we have large population we have uh, uh, different segment of uh, different type of persons complexities ethnicities so we took a lot of time for consultation to pass this bill finally this bill was passed in 2016 it's a comprehensive legislation in the sector covering rights of entitlements of the person with disabilities such as equality non discrimination and aims at the promoting inclusion accessibility social security health education skill training rehabilitation of person with disabilities this act provides for representation of persons with their disabilities in decision making process through central and state advisory board on disability at the national level as well as the state level on policy issues issues in disability sector the law also mandates involvement of persons with disabilities in disaster management process going beyond the provisions of uncrpd the rpwd act 2016 provides for a robust grievance redressal mechanism through district level committees state commissioner and chief commissioner of persons with disabilities and that's, also that's through designated yeah, special courts at district mm -hmm. level it stipulates punishment for violation of its provision to ensure effective implementation moreover we always involve person with disabilities in our committees while developing rules guidelines schemes programs for person with disabilities the spirit of inclusive decision making monitoring of this act already provides for appointment of chief commissioner for person with disabilities at the central level as well as the state level the chief commissioner for person with disabilities now supported India, can by I request an 11 you member advisory committee question 1 and advisory committee in round 2 who are expert in disability sector the office of chief commissioner has also been strengthening with the technical solutions such as provision for online submission of complaints and online hearing the cases the states have also appointed a state commissioner for person with disabilities 
The states commissioner is also supported by the five members advisory committee. Moreover, at the center level, we have a dedicated department. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Diyada, uh, for those, uh, that overview of the, uh, the Indian developments. I'd now like to uh, move to uh, Ms. Riznawati Utami, who's a uh, member from Indonesia of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And I'd like to ask you, uh, Ms. Utami, if you can point to two or three of the key issues where there's been real progress in advancing the harmonisation of national legislation. And also, what are the gaps and challenges uh, in addressing the issue of, of harmonisation? Over to you, Ms. Atami. Thank you, Mr. Andrew Bernis. Uh, in advancing the harmonisation of national legislation with the conventions, we need to refer to Article 4 on general obligations to be considered as a critical strategic direction for accelerating disability inclusive. Therefore, I, I have three key uh, issues that I would like to uh, consider for all of us and take into actions. First is to take all appropriate measures, including legislation in particular, to modify or abolish existing laws, regulations, custom, and practices that constitute discrimination against persons with disability. Since we know that um, a lot of emerging issues in many countries around the world include the institutionalization, legal capacity and rights of freedom of expressions, situation of risk and humanitarian emergency are considered to be uh, adopted properly to be in line with the convention. Secondly, with regard to the economic, social, and cultural rights, its state party should undertake to take measure to the maximum of its availability resources and were needed within the framework of the international cooperation with a view to achieving progressively the full realization of this right without prejudice to those obligations contained in the present convention that are immediately applicable according to the international law. So this also emphasized the Article 32 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability related to the international cooperations were still not yet addressed how to uh, include persons with disability and uh, their representative organizations. So this is the third point that I would like to emphasize how the connection between the participation of persons with disability and the international cooperations. As we know that in the development and, development and implementation of legislation and policies to implement the present convention, and other decision-making processes concerning issues related to persons with disability, we need to consider that all state parties shall closely consult with and actively involve persons with disabilities, including children with disability through their representative organizations. This provision actually already strengthened strongly with the general comment number seven on participation of persons with disability. The general comment is extremely help the state parties to implement on the ground how to put into action to engage persons with disability and the representative organization and all decision making processes. Therefore, uh, we observe that the gap and challenges in addressing this key aspect is Firstly, it's about institutional framework and policy development. It should ideally address adoption of national action plan strategy for the implementation of the conventions, which include time frames, specific indicators, and benchmark and data collection and disaggregated data, and also resource allocations. With a view to enhancing national implementation, legal and or statutory appointment of a coordination mechanism within government to facilitate related action in across different sector and levels with a clear structure, mandate, leadership, and sufficient authority to ensure mainstreaming and implementation of the conventions. The secondly, the gap is about <laughs> limited budget that provided by a state party. This is our observation uh, 
in years since uh, we reviewed the conventions. So uh, ideally, the state party should allocate the budget for the realization of economic, social, cultural rights of persons with disability. Also, uh, the segregated data that can support the policy implementations. Budget allocated also should be undertaken to promote research, including participatory research, research called by persons with disability and user-led research and development of universally designed goods, service, equipment, and facilities, and also, most importantly, the new technology, including information and communication technology, mobility aids, devices, and assistive technology, <coughs> giving priority to those at an affordable cost. Lastly, meaningful and effective participation are still, of persons with disability are still limited. Again, and the CRPD and also the general comments strengthen all state parties shall consult with and actively involve persons with disability. This is the language of the general comment that can basically Im implement and support the government how to involve and also consult with organization of persons with disability. And the other thing is I would like to emphasize is um, the organization of persons with disability and the representative organization, they can help the government at some point to make sure what is the exactly needs, what is the rights that are still uh, neglected or violated by the state parties. And I think that the participation of persons with disability mentioned in the general comment number seven and also the uh, under the article 4.3, on uh, state obligation or general obligation of state parties should be uh, implemented on the ground. And I think this is part of the message and key measure that all state parties should follow on how to uh, ensure an accelerating disability inclusive development in all sectors. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tamri, for that for reminding us of the importance of institutional procedures, participation of persons with disabilities, uh, data and resources as underpinnings for substantive law reform uh, and changes. Now I'd like to move to our next panellist, Ms. Frances Anderson, who will uh, move us into the world of national human rights institutions. And my question to, to, to you, Ms. Anderson, is how has the New Zealand Human Rights Commission helped to promote and support the harmonising of national legislation with the Convention? What have been its, the Commission's major contributions in this regard? Over to you, Ms Anderson. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished family panellists, that I'm quite humbled to be speaking alongside warmest greetings. Um, at the outset, can I say that although New Zealand does have equality and non-discrimination protections, we've made some positive progress in uh, implementing the CRBT, our legislative framework is by no means harmonised. Uh, we do have some law reform underway, but we have many laws not consistent with the CRPD. At least that's the view of us as a human rights institution and the CRPD committee. Uh, but it can be contested with public officials. So I think that points to a contribution that we as the Human Rights Commission make, which is to um, help build understanding of what harmonisation really looks like, uh, what the CRPD really requires. So I can't share a direct line from a Human Rights Commission intervention and a beautifully piece of harmonised legislation, because I think the change we're seeking uh, really requires uh, collaboration and interconnected activities to build the understanding of that paradigm, um, influence policy and practice, build legal jurisprudence and combine that sort of leads us to a consistent framework. Um, the Asia-Pacific region is very culturally and legislatively diverse, and that affects how we work. So I know we don't have a lot of time, but I just want to quickly uh, outline our enabling environment that we in the New Zealand Commission work with um, and in partnership with other people. We're an A-status human rights in in institution, which means we uh, comply with the Paris principles and are able to interact with the UN system, which benefits our domestic work. Uh, we have a very broad mandate to protect and promote human rights. Um, and monitor our uh, legal obligations, international human rights uh, obligations. We work collaboratively in partnership with Indigenous persons to uh, uphold the guarantees Aotearoa 
uh, has in its founding document, which of course includes Indigenous persons with disabilities. We're part of the independent monitoring mechanism uh, in partnership with the Ombudsman and a coalition of seven disabled persons organisations. And we have an active focal point uh, for the CIPD in the Office of Disability Issues, which has developed a disability strategy, disability action plan, and we in the Commission have also done a lot of work for an associated um, outcomes and indicator framework and improvement of data. So in short, very collaborative environment. Um, we've consistently advocated for a national social change program campaign. Uh, we haven't had government funding for that. So the commission has funded the initial development of a strategy designed by disabled people for social change because we're not talking about changing the letter of the law, we're really talking about dismantling ableism, those deeply embedded uh, negative social conceptions of disability that the law both reflects and consolidates and which results in the many inequities that we've heard about at this meeting. Um, as uh, my fellow panellists have said, uh, proper resourcing for persons with disabilities and representative organisations is critical because we have increased successfully increased opportunities for participation, meaningful participation in co-design, but the resources have not uh, followed that increased demand and activity. Where we probably have had more direct uh, positive um, outcomes is in our role as a court intervener um, in matters of human rights law. So we can assist the courts in the provision of human rights language and concepts that they can then draw from in their findings. So we've intervened in a range of court cases, ranging across employment issues, discrimination, um, Article 12, uh, legal capacity, uh, to advise on human rights law. And we've noticed a real shift in the decade from passing references to the convention to much more meaningful interpretations and outcomes and really establishing a principle that uh, legislation should be interpreted in a manner consistent with treaties that uh, we as Aotearoa New Zealand have ratified, even if legislation is silent on it. Of course, we would prefer legislation was not silent on the CRPD um, in that we consistently seek to have the CRPD expressly embedded in legislation and policy. And that has occurred in only a couple of pieces of legislation, um, despite quite a lot of reform going on. Um, that's not to say that disabled people's rights haven't been considered and uh, require to be responded to in legislation, um, but we would prefer that there was explicit reference to the convention as a whole, precisely so as we just heard the purpose, the definitions, the principles, and the general obligations, uh, not just sort of specific aspects or articles um, that are seen as most relevant to that particular proposal. Um, I'm aware that time is racing very quickly, so um, perhaps I can uh, share some of the other interventions in the next question, but I think one of the other things that we've tried to do is make sure that the status of disability rights are visible in reporting on all of the treaties that we have ratified, not solely the CRPD, uh, and, and building that collective responsibility for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Francis, for that. We now move to the second round of questions, and uh, for those who went over a bit, perhaps I could ask you if you could try and compress your, marks, uh, your remarks a little bit uh, in relation to the second question, uh, so that our commentators and uh, interveners on the floor will have a chance to uh, to make their points as well. I'd like now to come back to Ms. Yong Kim uh, and to, uh, to ask you, from your point of view as the Vice Chair of the uh, CRPD Committee, what have been the effective strategies uh, that you've seen that uh, have strengthened the harmonisation of national legislation uh, with the Convention. Over to you, Ms. Kim. Thank you. Uh, relation of the Convention and Asia are fast beginning. Uh, according to the report, and one of the um, person with disability myself who were there, the idea of the convention first emerged in, in uh, UN ASCAP listen, and UN ASCAP involved very actively throughout the drafting process to its latest patients. Today is the momentum at the high level intergovernmental meeting on the final uh, review of the Asia and Pacific decade of persons with disabilities. Um, what are Effective strategy to strengthen the harmonizing of national legislation with the convention about this uh, question. First, I would like to stress that the primary youth 
duty of the state party to the convention is to harmonizing their domestic law with the provision of the treaty. Above all, I would like to recommend that you emphasize the importance and scope of the necessary legislative review process and identify the priority area where the convention should change existing law at the um, country uh, national level. I have often encountered cases where the state parties submit national report without looking at specific domestic law for implementing the convention. Instead, some of the state party answer that they are implementing the agreement based on their constitutions. This convention emphasized the specific rights of persons with disabilities through provision based on the human rights model. There is a need for domestic law that can guarantee the specific rights of the person with disabilities. And this domestic law must include the basis for budgeting to implement this law. Secondly, it must uh, involve the repeal of law in, in constant with the convention and their replacement by laws that guarantee the enjoyment of the rights guaranteed. It also consists of removing law restricting or limiting the in enjoyment of persons with disabilities of their human rights equal to others. And it requires introducing or strengthening law that mandate positive measure and provide active support to remove the economic, social, and other barriers faced by persons with disabilities in your country. Certainly, I want to stress the state party that the general principle of Article 3 of the CLPD are the principle of the legislative and the amendment process for implementing the convention and the most effective strategy to strengthen the harmonizing of national legislation with the convention. The intent strategy is aligned with the principles and uh, objectives of the convention. So after intern uh, strategy um, um, for the next step, uh, we needed to strengthening uh, this um, Article 3 of general principle of CLPD strong uh, needed to link it to um, uh, strategy for the next step of the UN ASCAP or Asia Pacific area, I believe. Thank you for Thank you very much. Again, that's, four, that's four and a half minutes. Uh, could, you, could you wrap up very quickly? Yeah. Thank you. Ah, okay, thank you. you. You have finished. Sorry to sorry to interrupt. We are under a little time pressure. Uh, now, Mr. Tiyadev, and and uh, we have four minutes to answer your uh, second question, um, uh, and that is, in your view, what more needs to be done to strengthen CRPD implementation and monitoring at the national level, and what are the the lessons about those issues that that you can give, present to us from the experience of, of India. Over to you, Mr. Yadav. Thank you, Professor. We believe that having a comprehensive law in itself is not enough. We are continuously working towards its effective implementation and developing schemes and programs, as well as taking affirmative action in line with the spirit of law to achieve objective of inclusion and empowerment of persons with disabilities. The top priorities of the government of India for further inclusion and empowerment of PWDs is focused on four key strategies, the educational empowerment, health and nutrition, economic empowerment, and socio-legal framework. The government is striving to achieve quality, accessibility, inclusiveness, and continuity in education for students with disabilities through various measures such as adoption of a new education policy 2020, and development of national curriculum framework. The policy recognizes free and compulsory education up to age of 18 years to all, including students with disabilities. It further encourages and promotes barrier-free access to education for all children with disabilities. Provision has been also made to ensure 5% reservation for students with disabilities in higher educational institutes and scholarships to support an education of students with disabilities. Universal access to equitable, affordable, and quality health care, nutrition, and rehabilitation focused on wellness of PWDs is the way forward 
for the government in, in the direction of ensuring health and nutrition. Measures for skilling, entrepreneurship, sustainable policies and programs are being implemented for ensuring appropriate employment opportunities to achieve equity in labor force participation. In this endeavor, government has already reserved 4% vacancies in government establishment for persons with dis disabilities. National Action Plan has been introduced for a skill training of the PWDs to make them employable in different sectors. We have a separate corporation to channelize funds for promoting economic development ac activities and self-employment opportunities for the benefit of PWDs. For the social legal empowerment, the government is committed to responsive policy making, anticipating the future demands and needs of the PWDs. The country is now adopting the whole of government approach to ensure overall development and well-being of the PWDs. Proactive service delivery mechanism with better use of technologies envisaged as strategic enablers for achieving inclusion of persons with disabilities in true manner. Creation of barrier-free environment is the key for this social inclusion. The government is working towards developing sector-specific disability inclusive harmonized guidelines for ensuring accessibility in various facilities and services. The government is also in process to formulate a new national policy for PWDs covering key sectors like education, health, rehabilitation, early identification, skilling, inclusion, accessibility, effective participation. Our government remains committed to undertake continued measures for creating an accessible and inclusive society for persons with disabilities to ensure that no one is left behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yadav, for those, uh, those comments. I'd now like to return to Ms. Utami. Uh, and once again, in to drawing on your experience as a CRPD uh, committee member, what innovative measures have you identified in the practice of states to overcome the gaps and challenges of harmonization or non-harmonization? And what do you think are the main opportunities or priorities in our region to more effectively harmonize national legislation with the convention in countries of the region? Over to you, Mr. Tamil. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, we actually identify what are innovative measures that the state parties can do. So there are many things that the state party can do to, to make sure what innovative measure can be done to accelerate disability inclusions. First, we can, uh, state party can do the legal reform. And in this very effective way, some country already make an evidence how they uh, do the legal legal reform on uh, legal capacity for people with psychosocial disabilities. And also uh, the other innovative measure can be uh, create responsive budgetary on disability and also national and local action plan on persons with disabilities. But these innovative measures has two key requirements. First thing is under the general common number seven on participation. Again, I repeat, the participation of persons with disability has to be included in all uh, legal and regulatory framework and procedure across all level and branches of governments. State parties should also consider consultation with and the involvement of persons with disability as a mandatory step prior to the approval of laws, regulation, and policies, whether mainstream or disability specific. Therefore, the consultation should begin in the early stages and provide an input to the final product and all decision-making processes. And this consultation should include all persons with disabilities, uh, including persons with psychosocial and intellectual disabilities and, uh, and other wide diversity of persons with disability at local, national, regional, and international level. Second requirement is that a government budget is the most important economic policy and planning document and is an essential means by which to assess government efforts for the realization of human rights. I would like to quote from the UNOHCSR and International Pub Budget Partnership publication on realizing human rights through government budget. The close relationship between budget 
public budgets and human rights has been recognized by international human rights mechanism in their assessment of state compliance with human rights obligation. Civil society actors, uh, grassroots organization, persons with disability organization, human rights advocates, and other should take a look to social audits, and they should be involved also in the expenditure tracking, budget scorecard, and other budget assessment tools to develop critical evidence of human rights effort and to advocate for necessary budget-related steps to be better uh, realization of uh, human rights. In this way, uh, the state party uh, can be uh, supported to close the gap between rhetoric and reality and hold governments to account for their actions. In addition, I'm talking about the fiscal policy. The fiscal policy is very critical in terms of guaranteeing human rights. This is a tool that can uh, guarantee human rights realization at the state level. Without resources, there is no rights. In the same way that budgets reflect the true priorities of states, tax system, to what extent different actors contribute to tackling this priority. Last but not least, if all state party can uh, follow this requirement, actually it can uh, help the government and also the econo social economic uh, perspective. We know that there is a research on the, uh, from ILO. If some country provide or implement inclusive policy planning and budgeting, it will increase the gross domestic product until 7% of the GDP level from the country. So I think this is kind of open opportunity for all state party, uh, how can uh, provide more good practices and inclusive policy in the future, especially in the Pacific, Asia and the Pacific region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Utami. And now turn uh, again to Ms. Anderson. Uh, and once again, uh, given the experience of the New Zealand Human Rights Commissions, what are the what are the roles that human rights institutions play in monitoring the implementation of the convention? You've spoken about that to some extent, but please, if you'd like to expand on that or add any other relevant issues, please feel free to. Over to you. Um, look, I think the primary thing is um, as a as a human rights institution trying to model what it is we're seeking from other actors, and that's to ensure that we have a barrier-free environment to the leadership of disabled people. We benefit from uh, having a formal partnership with disabled people as part of the independent monitoring mechanism, uh, but I think we can um, ensure as a human rights institution collectively uh, across the region that we're actively consulting with and involving disabled people in all phases of our uh, research and reporting. And as I mentioned, not solely on the CRPD. Um, yes, the CRPD uh, articulates some uh, particular enablers to uh, to all of the universal human rights, but it doesn't accord new rights. It is, you know, positioning disabled people as rights holders who should have been enjoying without discrimination all of the civil and political and economic, social, cultural rights enshrined in those other treaties. And I mention that because, um, you know, for the for the defence of well, the CRPD is only sort of fifteen or sixteen years old. I think it's really important that we build the visibility, the collective responsibility, but also draw draw from the jurisprudence that's been accruing across those other uh, treaties about uh, what those rights look like as we support uh, harmonisation uh, in the law. And there's lots of good guidance that uh, we can access uh, from the Asia-Pacific Asia Forum, uh, one of the Global Alliance uh, of National Human Rights, and from the CRPD committee itself uh, in terms of how we um, monitor the CRPD, which also, of course, underscores the, the meaningful uh, involvement of disabled people. I think 15 years on, uh, we are still, as I mentioned, um, educating governments and public officials um, in the intent and the obligations of the CRPD, uh, because, it, as I said, it isn't just a matter of changing words in a policy, it is building that kind of true uh, understanding. So, um, again, as I mentioned, even though we are uh, diverse legislatively and culturally, I think we can draw together some shared experience uh, as national human rights institutions um, around um, 
the social model of disability and particularly what that means for Article 12 based uh, legislative reform. Um, the social model of disability and disability as a social construction means that we have to domesticate it in our cultural context, but I think we could still uh, draw some commonalities uh, around Article 12, which is often described as the soul of the convention around ensuring legal agency in all circumstances, all impairments, and that inalienable rights holders. I think people have talked particularly around, you know, uh, repeal of guardianship laws, forced interventions for persons with uh, psychosocial disabilities or uh, learning impairments. Um, and I think Article 5, uh, you know, these are core uh, human rights principles, I guess, of equality and non-discrimination. But if we could get universal design, non-discrimination, reasonable accommodation and equal recognition before the law and to continue to build and share uh, understanding of that across the region to support and underscore each, uh, uh, each other's work, I think that would be uh, of, of real benefit. Thank you uh, very much for that. And I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned the, those issues. We've spent a, a good deal of time, I guess, focusing on institutional participation, fiscal uh, and other critically important matters, but perhaps less time on the, the issues where there are problems. And I recommend to you the, the various SCAP publications which came out of this project, which show that in relation to Article 12 and legal capacity, there are serious issues across the region even in those countries which have amended their laws in terms of non-discrimination uh, and the incorporation of the definition in the convention. There's still a long way to go. Understandings of reasonable accommodation uh, and a range of substantive issues of that sort still need a lot of intention. But as I say, they are covered extensively in those publications and they, uh, I think, should be taken into account with the very important points we've heard today. And now let me turn to our discussants. Uh, as I said, we have two. And let me start with Ms. Sawa Tongkwe, uh, a member of the uh, CRPD committee. Uh, and can I ask you, uh, Ms. Uh, Tongkwe, tapping into your knowledge and, and building on the panel discussion so far, would you share with us your thoughts on how governments and other stakeholders can work together better to ensure the harmonization of la national legislation with the convention? What more can we do in concrete terms? Over to you. And you have three to four minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, once, I would like to start now because I have only three minutes. Once country becomes state parties to the convention, the state party are duty bearer to the convention. So I therefore would like to reiterate first, state party clause should have a close consultation with and active involved persons with disability in their developments and implementations of legislations and policy to implement the conventions and in other decision-making processes. An effective and meaningful participation of persons with disability, including but not limited to women, children, older persons, ethnic minority groups, indigenous persons, and other persons belonging to underrepresented groups, and the organizations of persons with disability and effective and meaningful participation requires a human rights-based approach and ensure good governance and social accountability, and to take all appropriate measures to eliminate all forms of discrimination to all persons with disability by any person, any organizations, or private enterprise. And also broaden data collections on persons with disabilities to include desegregated uh, fields such as age, sex, race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, and indigenous status. And second, seriously respects and accepts and considers a court cutting issue stipulated by the convention when implementing and it is necessary to establish a mechanism to eliminate all forms of implementing gaps to enable clause ministry co coordinations. These five issues, equality and non-discrimination, women with disability, Children with disability, awareness, blessings, and accessibilities are cross cuttings. 
and this is important, and these five issues related closely to one another, and they are fundamental cross cutting because they have a broadened impact too on all other articles concerning to civil uh, civil rights and uh, political political rights. And third. Um, reinforced Article 32, international cooperation with regard to economic, social, and cultural rights, state party to take specific measures to the maximum of its available resources within a framework of international cooperation with a view of achieving progressive to the full realization of the rights of persons with disability without any prejudice to those obligations contained in the conventions, and it is immediately applicable according to other international law, which is, I think, CRPD State Party has already ratified. Um, and also, they have a specific mechanism should be in place to ensure an effective and independent of the monitoring, a national monitoring implementation, and, mon, uh, and also the, uh, the follow-up, which is effective involvement of organizations of persons with disability and meaningful participation of diverse uh, uh, disability uh, groups in this regard. And also the general comment of uh, CRPD should be in place to have a clear-cut understand, understanding in order to implement the convention and consult with other um, organizations of persons with disability and also cross ministry uh, identity within the gov government of the state party. Thank, thank you very thank, much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Quinn. And now turn lastly to Dr. Abdi. Uh, and uh, Dr. Abhi, in light of the panel discussion we had or Indonesian's experience, could you share your reflections on the successes and challenges of harmonization of Indonesian law with the CRPD? What are the, what are the main lessons uh, that we might draw from the Indonesian experience? Over to you, Dr. Abdi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, oh ya, yeah. yeah. terima kasih. Ya, yeah, bahwa uh, terkait dengan uh, CRPD bahwa Indonesia uh, telah memiliki uh, ketentuan khusus sebagaimana diatur di dalam uh, ketentuan pasal 28i uh, ayat 4 Undang-Undang uh, Dasar Negara Republik Indonesia tahun 1945 di mana penghormatan, pelindungan, pemenuhan, penegakan, dan pemajuan hak asasi manusia menjadi tanggung jawab negara, khususnya pemerintah. Kemudian di Indonesia juga mempunyai Undang-Undang 39 tahun 99 tentang hak asasi manusia. Sebagai amanat konstitusi, juga sebagai amanat dari UNCRPD, maka Indonesia juga telah mengesahkan Undang-Undang 8 tahun 2016 tentang penyandang disabilitas, dan di sana juga mengamanatkan ada 10 peraturan pemerintah sebagai pelaksanaan daripada undang-undang disabilitas tersebut yang kemudian di dalamnya melibatkan ada beberapa kementerian lembaga antara lain Kementerian Sosial, Kementerian eh, PPN atau Bapenas, Kementerian Dikbud, Kementerian Hukum dan Asasi Manusia dan Kementerian Ketenagakerjaan dan Kementerian Keuangan. Kemudian Indonesia juga telah memiliki yang telah dilaksanakan dari tahun 1998 sampai sekarang yaitu adanya Rencana Aksi Nasional Hak Ajazi Manusia atau RANHAM yang sekarang telah sampai kepada generasi kelima berdasarkan Peraturan Presiden eh, nomor 53 tahun 2021 di sana sebagai kelompok sasarannya 
juga telah uh, mengedepankan penyandang disabilitas sebagai kelompok sasaran utama yang terkait dengan uh, penghormatan terhadap hak ajasi manusia selain perempuan, anak, dan masyarakat adat. Kemudian, uh, di dalam pembentukan peraturan undang-undangan, Kementerian Hukum dan HAM dengan kementerian atau kementerian lembaga lainnya, Kementerian Sosial, Kementerian Dikbud yang tadi saya sudah sampaikan juga, telah melibatkan OPD atau Organisasi Penyandang Disabilitas di dalam pembentukan peraturan perundang-undangan. Di dalam implementasinya, karena di Indonesia banyak sekali eh, lembaga pemasyarakatan atau rutan atau yang seringkali kita eh, sebut sebagai, kalau di masa lalu sebagai penjara, maka lembaga pemasyarakatan itu juga dirjennya telah mengeluarkan surat edaran Uh, untuk menerapkan apa yang disebut dengan unit pelayanan disabilitas. Di Indonesia memiliki lembaga pemasyarakatan dan rumah tahanan negara hampir 816 dan semuanya sudah melaksanakan unit pelaksana teknis atau unit pelayanan khusus bagi uh, disabilitas. Kemudian selanjutnya uh, di dalam pembentukan peraturan undang-undangan yang terkait disabilitas maka Indonesia eh, pemerintah kami tinggal satu yang belum selesai yang terkait dengan bagaimana eh, eh, yang terkait dengan aksesibilitas yang dikelola atau yang dilaksanakan oleh pemerintah Indonesia yang terkait dengan hal-hal yang masalah eh, keuangan dan lain sebagainya tapi sekali lagi bahwa pemerintah kami terus menerus melaksanakan eh, secara komitmen secara eh, eh, konsisten untuk melaksanakan UN CRPD untuk disesuaikan uh, dengan peraturan perundang-undangan yang ada di Indonesia. Sekali lagi, pemerintah kami, pemerintah Indonesia dari waktu ke waktu akan terus menerus memberikan penghormatan, pelindungan, pemenuhan dan penegakan hak-hak para penyandang disabilitas yang tentunya juga akan terus disesuaikan dengan UN CRPD. Ini yang bisa saya sampaikan. Terima kasih. Thank you very much, Dr. Hardy. And I'd now like to thank all our panelists and our two commentators for their insights. Uh, and it's now for me to hand back, uh, to hand the, the, the meeting back to the chair to invite interventions from the floor. Over to you, uh, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Professor and the panelists for our very inspiring panel discussions and contributions made during the round table. Before I invite countries to make interventions, I'd like to welcome the Minister from Cambodia who has joined the group this morning. Uh, Your Excellency will be making his country statement uh, 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 after the announcement. I beg uh, the audience indulgence in allowing the, His Excellency to deliver Cambodia's country statement, which was missed out uh, yesterday. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you. Excellency, Madam Amida Sasha Aliza Banda, Deputy Secretary General of United Nations and Deputy Secretary of ASCAP. Excellency, Mr. Chairman, Your Excellency, Ladies and Gentlemen, today, on behalf of His Excellency Wong Sot, Minister of Social Affairs, Veteran and Youth Rehabilitation, Roja Government of Cambodia, I wish to congratulate UNSCAP and the Government of Indonesia for organizing this important meeting. Relation related in this topic, CRPD in harmonization, Cambodia ratified in 2012. The Royal Government of Cambodia wish to reconfirm its firm commitment to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability and is pleased to share some of the, our achievements during the Pacific Decade for Persons with Disability to 2023 to 2022. Royal Government of Cambodia took concrete steps to translate relevant international infra uh, framework and into the, our national policy. 
the law on the protection and the promotion of the right of people with disability is being reviewed to better align with COPD. And the second national disability strategy plan, NDSP, was adopted in, in December 2019 following the comprehensive consultation with stakeholders, including organizations of persons with disability, coordination mechanism with disability. Coordination mechanism have been established at both national and subnational level. In relation in this in inclusive work, our subdegree of on disability quota aim at the determining the rate and formal, formality of uh, recruitment of persons with disability to work in the public and private sector as being implemented. A total of 8,856 persons with disability were employed in public and private sector in 2021 which person with increased 17 person uh, compared to 2020. In relation in political participation, relevant poli policy and tool to enable person with disability to fulfill participation in election process have been put in place by the National Election Committee. Uh, 1,652 persons with disability registered for the 2017 commune election compared to 3,531 in 2013 and 14,463 female 5,840 registers for the 2018 National Election. Representatives of persons with disability were invited to be observer at the commune and national election process. Promote accessibility, the Royal Government of Cambodia adopt standard, standard on physical accessibility to infrastructure in September 2019 and has rolled out physical accessibility training in 10 provinces. Cambodia sign language interpretation include international, international and private TV tele channel, TV channel. Access to appropriate assistive device is free of charge in Cambodia. From 2013 to 2021, there were 215,200 of the contact with clients of 11 physical rehabilitation center and 66 percent of these clients were women. In addition, to uh, 65, zero, uh, 15 prosthetic or tasks and wheelchair were provided. The Your Excellency, in the interest of time, I will have to ask you to conclude your statement, please. National Disability Strategic Plan 2019-2023 includes the dedicated strategy objective women and girls with disability. The Ministry of Women Affairs has identified women and girls with disability as one of vulnerable group of women in the gender mainstreaming strategy file. And <coughs> it's improved. It, to, to improve the availability and reliability of disability data, the Washington Group questionnaire, one trusted questionnaire, was used in collect data, uh, disability, uh, Cambodia, democratic health and survey, health and survey. In 2021 and 2014, in the national census, census 2019, in addition, disability identification process has been piloted in 2020 and has now extended to the community level with uh, over 2,500. Uh, Excellency, to, uh, I have to cut short your statement yes, in order I, to allow others to speak. Thank you very much.
thank you, Cambodia, for the country statement. Distinguished delegates, I now invite you to make brief interventions related to the topic of harmonization of national legislations with CRPD. Once again, a kind reminder, in the interest of time and allowing as many delegates to speak as possible, I request that you keep your interventions very short, not longer than two minutes. Thank you. I would now like to Im invite the Deputy Executive Director, National Council on Disability Affairs from Philippines to make his intervention. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to um, speak before the, this body about uh, the Philippine intervention on four areas. The first one is on Article 1 and the preambular paragraph on the concept of persons uh, of a disability as an evolving concept. Number two, on the uh, Article 11, on the situation of risk and uh, emergencies. Um, and number three, on Article 28, on social protection floors, um, adequate standard of living and also on the Article 24 of the Convention with respect to education. First is uh, we have to consider the concept of disability in the preamble or paragraph of the Convention uh, as an evolving concept because in our legislation, we were able to consider the adoption of the, the definition in Article 1. However, because of consultations, we go back to the model of medical model because we recognize uh, health conditions like cancer, uh, living with cancer, uh, rare disease as a health conditions and consider them as persons with disability. Uh, maybe the panel can react on that. Number two, with respect to situation of risk in Article 11 and Goal 7 of Inchon Strategy Framework, we took note of uh, evacuation centers in our Philippine Development Plan so that it will be a provi providing friendly spaces. Uh, number three, with respect to the social protection, um, it's an issue because of COVID. Uh, is social assistance be made, uh, for example, providing uh, uh, a benefit of uh, 2,000 pesos as a social protection floor uh, would be an adequate standard of uh, living as uh, in the context of Article 28. And finally, with respect to Article 24 and inclusive education, we see still in our legislations that uh, children with disabilities, those with severe disabilities, are still in the segregated uh, type of educational um, modalities. So, um, okay, uh, that's all, uh, Madam Chair. Now give the floor to the Attorney General of Republic of the Marshall Islands, uh, who will be joining us via Zoom. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Lama Tofilippo from the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and I'm pleased to deliver this intervention on behalf of our Attorney General, Mr. Bernard Adenuin, who unfortunately could not be able to join us today. And this is a statement. Madam Chair, thank you for allowing me time for my intervention. The Constitution of the Republic of the Marshall Islands provides that no treaty or other international agreement which is finally accepted by or on behalf of the Republic shall of itself have the force of law in the Republic unless approved by the Parliament. Although the Marshall Islands was and is fully committed to fulfilling our human rights obligations, namely those in relation to persons with disabilities, this constitutional provision requires further action by the government in terms of an enabling legislation. Under the leadership 
of the then Minister of Culture and Internal Affairs, who is now the President of our Young Republic, His Excellency David Kabua, the government was able to lay the groundwork for such a task. In early 2014, we were fortunate to receive technical assistance in the form of two consultants from ESCAP and the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, respectively, to provide guidance in terms of developing legislation to domesticate the CRPD. The outline of a bill was made, followed by an actual bill of which various versions were considered as it was important to take into account the capacity and resources of RMI at that time. A final bill was provided to the cabin for its consideration, then onward to our parliament, where it was adopted in early 2015. Mr. Tony, like I'll have to remind you, you are 21 seconds over your time. Please round off, thank you. RMI was not yet a member state of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, but seated after the adoptions of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act 2017, and the Act was first in the Republic in the Pacific region to be fully compliant with the con Convention. Komo Tata, and over to you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now invite the Director General of Services for Persons with Disabilities and the Elderly, Ministry of Family and Social Services, Turkey, to take the floor. A kind reminder, uh, your time is two minutes. Honorable Chair, distinguished participants, uh, first of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the panelists for their valuable contributions. I will give a glance of Turkey's work on harmonization of legislation. Turkey acts in accordance with the vision of a society that leaves no one behind in its development journey and cre creates policies and services for a more just and egalitarian world with a rights-based and development-oriented understanding in a disability-inclusive way. Within the scope of our efforts to harmonize the national legislation with the CRPD, in 2005, for the first time, the Turkish Disability Act, which is a framework in the field of disability, was put into effect. In 2014, the Turkish Disability Act was revised to further strengthen the right-based understanding and was brought in line with the CRPD. 2030 barrier-free vision document, which reveals our vision of an inclusive society where persons with disabilities can realize their potential as equal citizens was announced on 3rd of December 2021. 2030 barrier-free vision document has a high-level policy, is a high-level policy. Uh, this document covers 107 action areas for realization of 31 targets under policy lines, which are inclusive and accessible society, protection of rights and justice, health and well-being, inclusive education, economic security, independent living, disaster and humanitarian emergencies, implementation and monitoring. In order to ensure the implementation and monitoring of the vision document, the National Action Plan for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities will be declared on December 3, 2022, on International Day of Persons with Disabilities, with the participation of all stakeholders. With all these efforts, we aim to enable persons with disabilities to live a life in an all-inclusive society where they can realize their potential as equal citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director General. We'll now invite the delegate from Bhutan to make the interventions. We have the Deputy Chief Planning Officer from Gross National Happiness Commission. You have the floor, sir. Uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Honorable Chair, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just like everything else in life, our health and abilities are all subject to change and deterioration. If we are defined by energy and vigor today, there is a time when for, 
for even the simplest act, of, act we perform daily, we will need some kind of assistance. Therefore, recognizing this reality, the Royal Government of Bhutan has introduced and approved the National Policy for People with Disability in the year 2019. Uh, this policy is in line with the commitment towards equality and inclusivity of the Constitution of Kingdom of Bhutan. And besides serving as a refuge to guide the dignity and ensure basic rights of uh, persons with disability, it is expected to uplift their livelihood. Article 7, Fundamental Rights, Section 15 of the Constitution states that all persons are equal before the law and are entitled to equal and effective protection of the law and shall not be discriminated against on the grounds of race, sex, language, religion, politics, or other status. In addition, Article 9, Principle of State Policy, Section 22 of the Constitution also states that the state shall endeavor to provide security in the events of sickness, disability, or lack of adequate means of livelihood for reasons behind, uh, beyond one's control. Also, in accordance with the philosophy of gross national happiness, Bhutan uh, continues to pursuit of inclusive socioeconomic development. Its development policies and plans are geared towards meeting the needs of all sections of the society, includes, including those who are marginalized and vulnerable. Uh, persons with disabilities were identified as one of the vulnerable groups in need of additional intervention from the Royal Government of Bhutan, uh, both in the 11th five-year and the 12th five-year plan, which covers the period between 2013 to 2022. May I kindly request to conclude your statement? Okay. With the approval of the national policy for people with disability, the drafting of, legisla uh, the drafting of legislation for uh, persons with disability was also recommended by the vulnerability baseline assessment conducted by the Israel GNS Secretariat, and it was also discussed in the Parliament with some MPs recommending for an act for PWDs. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now give the floor to the delegate from China, from China Disabled Persons Federation, who will be joining us online. You have the floor. Uh, excellencies and distinguished delegates, we will now move on to our interventions from our CSO partners. We have uh, my apologies, is China online? No, we will proceed. We now have Mr. Anthony from Adrian, thank you. Yeah, um, Honorable Madam Chair, distinguished panelists and delegates. Um, all the most Asia Pacific states, including Indonesia, have undertaken legislative reviews that have led or relate to amendments to existing laws. In some cases, however, legal reviews and amendments do not always give effect to the intended CRPD through implementation and do not cover all important sectors, including legal substance, legal structure, and legal culture. Some provisions excluding of persons with disabilities and are not in compliance with the CRPD have not been fully weeded out of general laws. And therefore, to accelerate the harmonization of uh, national legislation with the convention, we would like to suggest a few steps to take. First, national and local laws across all areas need to be scrutinized regularly for consistency and compliance with the CRPD. Second, the National Disability Rights Commission need to be established or strengthened as a truly independent human rights institute and disability rights realization indicators based on the convention need to be developed. Indonesian Disability CSO Forum for Disability Rights Monitoring have developed such indicators and are being adopted by our National Disability Commission. Third, Proposed new laws and policies must be developed and or assessed for compatibility and compliance with the CRPD and are modified before the adoption and enactment with meaningful uh, participation of persons with disability as well as their uh, representative organizations. Fourth, the priority area for legislative reforms 
should include the harmonization of legislative definitions with disability and disability discriminations with the CRPD. Fifth, reasonable accommodations should be integrated in all national and local development policies and programs. And lastly, there needs to be guidelines and trainings for governments at all levels to harmonize and implement the CRPD in the, existi in, in the existing as well as new laws and policies with open, full, and meaningful participation of persons with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we now give the floor to Tariel from CBM. You have the floor. Thank you, Chair. He's joining us via Zoom. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair um, and the delegates. Uh, I'm speaking from Lucknow, the capital city of Uttar Pradesh, a province, largest province of India. India has harmonized two of its disability-specific legislations and is in the process of harmonizing the remaining two. The mainstream legislations would also be harmonized. I suggest that the member states may agree to achieve the target of harmonizing disability-specific legislations by 2024 and the mainstream legislations by 2026. UNSCAP may consider constituting an advisory group or, may, uh, or more groups uh, to, in, the, in the states to help them expedite harmonization. While doing so, it's a very important that the member states should be mindful of the fact that there is no mismatch between the human rights-based definition of disability in the CRPD or in their domestic legislations and the definition and the way the measurement uh, of disability is done. That is not human-based, that is medical model. For aligning these two and for implement better implementation, I suggest that this meeting may resolve that all the member states to adopt the International Classification of Functioning, Disability and Health, ICF, as a standard framework for certifying disabilities and for collecting and compiling also the data. It should be done before 2030, sorry, 2030. It's important to rely to, to, for, for, for realistic comparisons across the reasons. All the member states frame a human rights-based policy, develop a strategy, and make an action plan. That's very important to implement the major provisions of the CRPD. And I would say on priority, they could take accessibility, which is very important. Sir, uh, I'd like table, you to conclude and, your intervention. Uh, and then member states should also ensure fully autom uh, autonomous monitoring, grievance, redressal mechanism, and enforcement of the uh, act. The UNCRPD could also perhaps uh, do something by uh, setting up some monitoring and enforcement mechanism. The I thank you for your intervention. We will now move on. Thank you. Please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Distinguished delegates, uh, excellencies, I see no more speakers on the list in front of me. I'd like to thank you all, especially our moderator for this panel, the panelists, and all the delegates for the lively discussions. The meeting has now concluded for the deliberations on Roundtable 1. Thank you. Thank you. अरे भैया पहले से तैयारी करना चाहिए इतना तो कॉमन सेंस होना चाहिए आपको बोलते हैं जब वे जस्ट नीड टू मिनट्स टू रीसेट द द पोडियम सो प्लीज बेयर विद
Excellencies, distinguished delegates, we will now move to round table two under agenda item three, innovative partnerships and engagements of persons with disability. Again, this round table will future, uh, sorry, feature our panel discussion followed by interventions from the floor. I now have the pleasure to invite Dr. Nuka, Professor of Research Center for Politics, National Research and Innovation, and Executive Director of Indonesia National Committee for Management of Social Transformation Program to moderate the panel discussion under this round table. Doc, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for this great opportunity. Excellency, distinguished delegates. Uh, I'm Trinuka Puchu Astuti. I'm honored to be moderator in this important roundtable discussion. Roundtable two is about innovative uh, partnerships and engagement of persons with disability. This topic is a, uh, one of the importance to make the right real for persons with disability in Asia and Pacific. The region once again highlighted the importance of advancing cooperation at all goals, particularly goals uh, 10. This cooperation framework has also been adopted to facilitate the imp implementations of the UNCRPD and relevant initiatives such as related with the SDGs 2030 goals, which all have a disability perspective, are important one to pay attention to. Using C CRPD as the guidelines indicate organizations of persons with disability or OPDs in the region have grown and become more focal and stronger for uh, of leaders and advocates who have been driving for meaningful participations of persons with disability in the decision maker and development agenda, including the action to address the social economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change. But there are critical gap and also challenges situations remind for persons with disability and OPDs to participate in and lead political and development process, ranging from the persistent lack of the accessibility and institutional barrier to misperception and stereotype about persons with disability. Therefore, this roundtable will discuss the current status, challenges, as well as inspiring practices and opportunity with regard to facilitating and strengthening partnership across various stakeholders, emphasizingly the role and leadership of OPDs in the region. Discussion will aim to inspire recommendations on strategies for strengthening innovative and efficient partnership toward disability inclusion for accelerating the implementations of Incheon strategy in harmony with the spirit and time frame of SDGs agenda. Excellent distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, in the day's round table two, we are lucky having four panelists in one discussion uh, who is of panelists has a unique experience and perspective, develop partnership and engagement of persons with disability there is, and also this, their institution. May I introduce the very important panelists. First, Her Excellency Mr. Aishat Mohammed Didi. She is from Maldives. Uh, she was the Maldives Highest Commissioner of uh, to India had served in Minister of Gender and Family from 2005 until 2009. The second one is Mr. Montian Bhutan from Thailand. Uh, he has served as a senator of the Upper House of the Royal Thai Parliament since 2009. He also served 
as an elected member of com committee on the right of person with disability. The third one is a, uh, Mr. Puak Tia Lim from Singapore. Uh, Mr. P. T. Lim uh, is a founder member of the ASEAN Disability Forum and has served as its cha chairman since 2017. He also board member of International Disability Alliance. The fourth one is Mrs. Uh, Sunita Rebecca Cheria from India. Uh, Mr. Cherian career over two decades has spent a sales human capital strategic board strategic work, uh, workforce transitions human resources sustainability and inclusion uh, diverse among others and i would like to welcome to all panelists uh, have been here today excellency distinguished delegate we we only have one hour for the discussion before interventions from the audience. I have to inform that this panel discussion will be conducted in two rounds. Uh, the each round for each panel only five minutes to demonstrate their thoughts and experiences. Without further, I would like to invite uh, Mrs. Uh, Didi from Maldives. As I know, uh, Maldives is one of the world's most geographical dispersed country and is significantly affected by climate change. We also know that persons with disability are disproportionately impacted by disaster. Given this unique context, what has the government of Maldives done to engage persons with disability and their representative organizations in the country's uh, key development agenda? For example, in the climate actions. Time is your ma'am, five minutes, please. Um, thank you, Chair. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. Um, as the Chair has rightly pointed out, Maldives is not only amongst the world's most geographically dispersed countries, but it is also among the most low-lying small island states of the world. The geographical distribution of the population of the Maldives makes it highly challenging to provide accessibility and services for persons with disabilities, especially those with uh, severe and profound disabilities. It is one of our biggest challenges. Uh, for instance, if we look into climate action, uh, this is particularly important. The islands are a mere one meter above the mean sea level. Uh, critical infrastru infrastructures such as hospitals, schools, water and sanitation systems, which are in close proximity to receding shorelines. These are at higher risk of devastation from impacts such as coastal flooding and storm surges as the sea level rises. And this is not no longer a, a conversation. This is the truth for small islands. Hence, given the scattered and low-lying nature of the small islands, Maldives in general is extremely exposed to climate change and its effects. And the vulnerable groups within the Maldivian community, especially persons with disabilities, are rendered even more vulnerable impact of climate action continues to be a major concern and as the government continues to seek more sustainable solutions, how do we engage persons with disabilities and the few OPDs in the country? I would like to take an example from recent uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we have disaster risk reduction plans and uh, in, when we do the disaster re risk reduction plans, we do address the challenges PWDs may face during a disaster. At island level, we have what we call the risk reduction plans. And these are done in collaboration with the representative organs, organizations and NGOs, including Maldives Red Crescent. For the COVID, um, um, the sectoral emergency response plans were developed by social sectors, education, health, social services. 
all plants had provisions for PWDs. However, I would like to share today the, the lesson we learned. One of the lessons we learned from this exercise was the unavailability of an existing system for communication with PWDs, especially in these highly dispersed uh, um, societies. Uh, for people with hearing, visual di disabilities, it was challenging for us to communicate messages, and we had to use NGOs as well as OPDs for communication with this. Mental health issues. Mental health issues was identified as a major concern for all families, especially families who had children, you know, with, um, um, for example, autism. Um, in lockdown situations, who could be involved with supporting the children. Um, as such, an emergency helpline for all vulnerable groups became a much needed necessity at that time, which we uh, put in place, and um, all PWDs registered were contacted by phone through this emergency line to check on their well-being and to identify specific needs. All significant needs that were identified, such as delivery of basic sanitation needs, delivery of food, whether it is hot meals, care packs, procurement of long-term medications, delivery to the islands, facilitation of access to health services. In order to provide all these services, we used NGOs, we used OPDs, as well as island councils. Many challenges in quarantine and isolation facilities where people had become positive for COVID. We had to uh, involve social worker visits, identify their needs and the family's needs, and um, disruption to educational and therapeutic services, especially the therapeutic services, posed huge challenges. For the first time in the history of Maldives, online therapy services were provided access. Oh, so sorry about that. Yeah. Anyway, I think my time is almost up, and um, I would like to say that um, sometimes disasters can come with silver linings. Um, COVID-19 lockdown helped us to strengthen uh, with new partnerships, the few um, NGOs working for people with disabilities, and through a decentralized coordination mechanism, we were able to provide services that were much needed, and that service is now continuing in the normal situation that we are in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Didi. Uh, I think one important is consider the system of communications with many kinds of disability and OPDs. I think that's the, the important point. I will continue uh, the second speakers to Mr. Montian Bhutan. Uh, in your rich experience as a parliamentarian, uh, parliamentarian who has very vocal and successful in advocating for disability rights, what important roles can parliamentarians play in driving transformative changes and facilitating multi-sectoral partnership for disability inclusion development. Time is yours, Mr. Montian, for five minutes. Friends, brothers and sisters, first of all, I'd like to thank UNSCAP and the Government of Republic of Indonesia for organizing such a superb event providing all of us to extend our spirits and our commitment to sustain the whole regional commitment towards rights and inclusion of persons with disabilities. I'm very fortunate that I became member of the Senate after the adoption of the CRPD. I'm quite fortunate to become member of the Senate right in the same year as Thailand ratified the CRPD. I'm quite fortunate that I participated in the formulation 
and strengthening negotiation and adoption of the CRPD as I join the ad hoc committee from the beginning. I'm also fortunate that since 1997, political reform in Thailand, the parliamentary system was more catering towards participation of the people, including persons with disabilities. So the system is the precondition for me to act as a parliamentarian in favor of persons with disabilities participation. In our Thai parliament system, we have the standing committee, and I chose to be part of the standing committee on social development since 2008, and I remain in such standing committee up to now. I also choose to participate in the standing committee on human rights. So by being in both standing committees, it provides me a good chance to echo my experience as a person from disability movement directly, as a person who fought for the formulation, revision of Disability Empowerment Act, which is the disability rights law in Thailand, and for me to transform the spirit and the provision of the CRPD into practice by calling for changes, revision, amendment of more than 50 pieces of legislation in Thailand in favor of being in compliance with the provision of the CRPD. In the Standing Committee, I also serve as a chairperson on Disability Subcommittee. Again, I keep my hat as disability movement product. So in my subcommittee on disability, we try to make a good distribution of representation from each disability organization at the national level and if the national organizations may not be responsive to some special interest groups, we also make use of seminars, forums, gathering, to have inputs and contribution from friends and colleagues in the disability movement. So as to gather enough information on ground and transform into policy suggestion and legislative uh, revision or even to propose a review and to propose for a new law. Also, in the parliament itself, we are allowed and we are uh, empowered by the legal mandate to invite governments, civil society organizations, and private sector to come and testify should there be any emerging issues that may have effect, affected the lives of persons with disabilities. So the parliament is a safe zone for all parties to come. Government officials are obligated the business sectors would like to showcase their contribution, and persons with disabilities feel safe and encouraged to speak the truth. In that sense, the system allows me to do that job. And in that sense, my background from disability movement gave me a chance to manifest the mentality and the spirit of disability movement. To conclude, I think it requires both the system, meaning the surrounding environment, and the fundamental background of an individual in the parliament to act as a good role of the parliamentarian to foster more 
collaboration and partnership among all stakeholders with emphasis on full and effective participation of persons with disabilities and their representative organizations. And to conclude, by the way, I was behind the process and actively participate in formulation of general common number seven, which is the true uh, driving force to accelerate full and effective participation of persons with disabilities in accordance with Article 4, Paragraph 3 of the Convention. I'm very proud of that, and I would like to invite all of you, whether you're from the government, business, and CSOs, to study <coughs> and take into your consideration when considering participation of persons with disabilities in all aspects, including if you have a chance to serve in the parliament in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Montian. Uh, you gave us uh, a very good experience. Uh, the equal communications and information access uh, are the right of all, not only the parliament itself, but also the full government and also the uh, OPDs and also for the person with disability. We will move on to um, Mr. Uh, P.T. Lim. Uh, Mr. P.T. Lim. In your view and your experience leading the Asian Disability Forum, how can organizations of persons with disability facilitate and support work on disability inclusive development at the sub-regional level, such as the implementations of Asian Enabling Master 2025? Time is yours. Uh, five minutes, please. Thank you very much. Uh... Professor Nuka, I would like to summarize my uh, sense and my thinking on this topic by four C's. All right, and I think it's very important for us to really think about very carefully about the issues of engaging uh, organizations of persons with disabilities and have a ground up approach to the very important issues that concerns every person with disability here in this region. The first C that, that I would like to share with you is the word community. I think for us to have a movement, we must have a community of people that has the same kind of thinking, the same kind of uh, approach to the topic that is at hand. Because we must always believe in the many helping hands approach and that there's synergy and there's power uh, in the fact that there are many, many of us in this community. The second C that I'm thinking about is the word common goals. Because a community that is divided, a community that's not driven by common goals is useless. And I think those of us in the disability movement realize that uh, we have the common goal of making sure that this world is more disability inclusive and that there's no prejudice, no bias. We have gone a, a long way for over the last 40 years since 1981 when the International Year of the Persons of Disability was started by the United Nations. And I think 41 quick years have passed since then and I'm very grateful to be able to be part of this movement, to be able to have this common goal of, honest, of making sure that, uh, that people with special needs, people with disabilities are within this community with a shared common goal. The third C is the word commitment. I think it is no point uh, having a lot of talk and no action. We must be committed to the cause of making sure that no one is left behind. And there's nothing about us without us. And that in this world that we are living in, we are committed to making sure that people with disabilities are engaged, are en enabled and, and, and empowered to become, to live their meaningful lives within the community that they live in. The fourth C I want to talk about is the word communication. Often, 
we may have a community, we may have, have a shared common goals, we may be committed, but we forgot to communicate. We forgot to share uh, our dreams, our aspirations. We forgot to really reach out to talk to other people. So grassroots, grassroots engagement is basically about communicating, about coming here, getting together in spite of our various uh, languages, despite the fact that we, we are unable to talk but use sign language, and, and yet we're able to communicate and make sure that we arrive at a common, common ground and common goal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Piti. You highlight uh, four key points, four, uh, four uh, key uh, points that are really important. Community, common goal, commitment, and communications. Uh, I will move on to uh, Mrs. Uh, Sunita. Uh, in your view, uh, and experience as a private sector uh, advocate for disability inclusion. What do you think are some of the most critical incentives that should be proven uh, for private sector entities to invest in disability inclusions? Time is yours for five minutes. Thank, thank you, you so much, uh, Dr. Nuke, and uh, thank you very much to the UNSCAP as well as uh, the government of uh, Indonesia for having invited me here. It's always a delight when you're with friends and when you're discussing things of such importance, which only builds on this conversation. So um, for those of you who, don't, uh, who haven't read the profile, I might be the only person representing the private sector today because I definitely feel and, uh, that uh, keeping such a large body outside these conversations will not probably help the cause. So here I am representing uh, Wipro today, which is an IT services company, which is based in India, and we employ more than 260,000 employees in our company alone. So you can imagine the, the stress that a lot of the private sector, specifically the IT companies are facing today, which is all about how do I hire people? How do I get the talent? And from the statistics that I've seen, uh, we have more than 1 billion people who have a disability across the globe. So clearly we're not tapping into that pool and, and when on one side we're stressing that, you know, we don't have adequate number of people to join the IT services, and on the other side, we know that we're actually eliminating a huge pool if we really don't tap into them. So from a question of incentives to me, it is more a need from the other side rather than the incentives that are given that we tap into this pool and we really get these folks ready to join companies uh, which, which have a need for such talent. Uh, if I were to just look at some of the other um, uh, objectives that the private sector may be enticed to take uh, employees with disability uh, is also the fact that there is something called the CSR fund. Now, I hate to correlate the CSR fund and disability. We absolutely do not enforce that. We do not advocate for that. But I do know that a lot of private companies today are taking the advantage of the CSR fund to be doing stuff around people with disability. And my point is, fair enough, if you've got more people into the conversation, then why not? The third is in terms of uh, just the sheer uh, level of investments that probably companies need to make. And I can talk about, uh, uh, for example, in Wipro, what we've tried to do is it is part of the design of our building. So, for example, universal design. Uh, it is something basic, I would say, that every company should just incorporate as and when they build new buildings. But how often do people really do that? And maybe at times the pushback is that there is a financial uh, expense to having this kind of a universal design in the buildings or to invest in assistive technology. And those are the areas, if, if I were to uh, put in, that maybe incentives to invest in these is probably what is needed for the private sector so that it's not just in terms of the financial assistance, maybe in the form of some tax breaks or maybe in the form of, uh, you know, when the, the, the level of uh, money that actually goes out when people 
face a disability in terms of just recuperation, the medical costs, the, you know, so those are probably the areas where I can think of where an incentive would make sense. Of course, the quotas are there, but I'm not a great advocate of the quotas, again, because the point is it may be good from a kickstart perspective, but after that, it has to be merit. So at least in Wipro, what we've said is it's merit above anything else, but we will ensure that we give you the adequate training. So there is investments that's required in training, in skilling, in ensuring that people reach the merit levels, but beyond that, it has to be merit if people with a disability or otherwise have to hold their head high to say that I have reached this position because of my own merit and not because of a quota. So I'm not uh, for the quotas, maybe as a kickstart, but there are other schemes, other ways in terms of financial assistance, which I'm sure the which are good incentives for the private sector to also be on board. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Sunita. You give a very important uh, point. Every company should have design and system uh, which uh, give opportunity to the people with disability that's a part of this company. Thank you. Uh, I would like to go back to uh, Ms. Didi. Uh, as a result of your engagement with person with disability, can you highlight some innovative policies and actions that your minister has undertaken to ensure that person with disability living in diverse communities receive the support and services they need. Please time is yours, five minutes. Thank you. Um, now this is an area that I could um, speak for many uh, five minutes. So I, I will try <laughs> and focus on just uh, two areas. And one is early intervention. Um, there's so much research on how good early intervention can support families, can help a child uh, as the child grows, a child with um, a disability. Um, um, as I said earlier, in a highly dispersed, geographically dispersed, uh, small island, small population communities, how do we do this? Our focus is now on community-based rehabilitation and training people to work with local families at island level, whether the population is less than 500 people or less than, than 1,000 people, training people. So this was launched in 2021. And uh, this has helped us in many ways. One is to decentralize um, services. Another is to increase accessibility to rehabilitation and other targeted services across the country. So through this program, we hope to have capable people in close proximity to the population where when our health management systems identifies a child with a disability, early intervention programs and support to the family can be provided so that from day one, we will be supporting and helping them. And this program, you know, through this program, our objective is to ensure equal opportunities for education, empowerment, especially empowerment of the family and the community, and in the long term, employment, and also to make sure, um, you know, we do this through the um, organizations in the communities. I would also like to mention the work we are doing with the Ministry of Higher Education, especially for increasing employment opportunities and reducing the discriminations that are faced by PWDs within the job market. This is a key priority for the country. Um, we have now managed to uh, provide about over 300 persons with disabilities with employment within 17 state-owned enterprises. Initially, we realized that just providing employment by itself is not adequate. They need a skill set. They also need um, 
The people who they work with also need sensitization. The employers, the co-workers, the colleagues, uh, systems have to be in place to facilitate the continuity of a job and also uh, opportunity for moving upwards. So for this, what we have done is to create the disability inclusive work environment. Um, more than 1,000 employees, both private and government, have been trained to accommodate to the employees, persons with disabilities. Um, we've also managed to allocate a quota for PWDs within civil service jobs, and that has been a challenge. But this has happened, and this, the regulations are in place. But it, it also means in the future we have to do quite a bit of more work. Um, we have what we call the technical and vocational edu education targeted for PWDs at school and education level. So identified personal interventions and work is being done for that. Um, the Polytechnic has um, special programs for uh, developing specific skill sets for different groups of people with disabilities. Um, and um, last but not least, um, social housing. Very often, where a job is available, there is no opportunity for social housing. Where a job is available, there is no opportunity for therapy. So therapy systems, are in, we are putting them in place. We are also allocating a specific category for application for social housing for people with disabilities and their families. So th these are some of the programs that we have um, started and specific programs in place. For the future, you know, somebody mentioned about the one billion people with disabilities in the world. You know, Maldives is a beautiful destination. It's also many people's dream uh, to visit the Maldives. Uh, why not for the people, this one billion people with disabilities? It's very difficult because accessibility to these islands from the point of landing at the airport to getting on a seaplane to reach in these islands is hard. This is one project we are now working on from government level, working with the tourism industry and working with the Ministry of Education. And I hope in the future one day I will be able to come and talk about the success of this project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Didi. Uh, it looks like uh, you make a circle. circle. So uh, from the identify, educations, uh, and employment to give the facility, and then the government also give a quota, and then also the social housing. And then uh, it's a very important uh, circle uh, to innovate uh, policies. Thank you. Uh, I, I will move on to uh, Mr. Montian. Uh, given your experience and work in the area of accessibility, how can governments use public procurement policy as a means to incentive accessibility and more broadly disability inclusions? And also, what's the criteria and measure can government put in place to make public procurement policy disability inclusive? Time is short, Mr. Montian, five minutes, please. Thank you very much, again. Um, during my last intervention, uh, intervention I uh, forget to mention one, uh, one uh, big advantage of having uh, a good system in the parliament that caters participation of persons with disabilities is that in our system, it was a provision in the Constitution and also the meeting uh, rules and procedures, which states that in the case of any legislative review that would have impact upon the lives of youth, women, the elderly, persons with disabilities, and persons belong to disadvantaged group, the 
composition of the ad hoc committee to review such legislation must comprise at least one third of those people who are affected by such law. So if we have been exercising such uh, provision very strictly in Thailand, and uh, I would like to encourage uh, many parliaments to do so in favor of persons with disabilities. Uh, the true answer of my second question is in the publication by UNSCAP, because UNSCAP has been a uh, champion and uh, taking leadership role in this manner. So I'd like to call your attention to read the publication on disability inclusive public procurement uh, and give uh, uh, UNSCAP a big round of applause for such excellent publication on this. Um, we have been working on accessibility for many, many years. Still, we are on the long way to go to achieve full accessibility in this region. We know that we're facing lots of difficulties and challenges. Some countries have come up with very advanced law. Some countries attach the accessibility standards with the law. But what we have seen as the biggest obstacle is that whatever you have in the law, everything ends with money. Because without financial condition, no matter what the law says, lack of budget support, lack of enough financial incentives, you cannot really achieve accessibility because accessibility has always been generally regarded as a burden in all levels of administration and management. So a few years ago, we, um, and I would have to give credit to uh, many folks at UNSCAP, Dr. Tata, for example, Ms. Chai Chai, Ms. Aiko Akiyama, we are of the belief that many transnational companies have been practicing and have been promoting their good practices on accessibility, especially in the area of digital accessibility. And you all know that many of these companies are US-based. So one wonder why these companies are so much in favor of accessibility products and services? Well, the answer is they are under the condition by law, by US law. You're probably quite familiar with US Access Board. You're probably familiar with Section 508. Now, I have to give credit to our friends, brothers and sisters in the United States for pushing for that. Well, we look at the case like in the United States and in the European Union, and we think it's time for Asia Pacific to rise. We have to look at the public procurement as a serious step forward towards achieving full accessibility. So we thought that perhaps Thailand and a few countries could serve as good model to begin with. So we organize meetings, seminars, and we can come up with a, a drafting of the paper publication. Uh, we had lots of consultation meetings with folks in the United States, like Access Board, the Accounting Department, and coordinated by our long-term colleague, Ms. Judith Human. So I have to say that uh, we owe to uh, her coordination a lot, too. So we come up with uh, suggestions that, uh, given the fact that many countries, over half of annual budget is spent on public procurement, and all of these public procurement spending will have direct and indirect impact upon accessibility of goods and services, especially access to building, transportation, information communication, and technologies, especially when we're dealing with digital transformation. 
So there must be some way to put the condition on how public procurement is engaged, is uh, put in the TOR or under the condition of bidding for a government contract. In Thailand, we are in the process of establishing something equivalent to Access Board, or we would call National Accessibility Super Board, working with cross-ministry sector, gathering accessibility standards at the international, national level. If there isn't, we have to formulate and adopt our own standards and promote the standards and enforce such accessibility standards through existing law, and finally nail down the implementation of such accessibility standards with public procurement policy requirement. We believe through the public procurement policy, we will be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Through public procurement, we will see why all of these transnational corporations talk so eloquently and comfortably how they love accessibility. And they don't tell you how they make a lot of money out of accessibility because they were conditioned. Accessibility is not only good because it's a human right. Accessibility is not only good because it serves the social inclusion purpose. Accessibility could lead to a lot of money making, a lot of profits. So, accessibility through public procurement policy could bring about true disability inclusion in our region. Another aspect of public procurement is through preferential treatment in favor of buying goods and services from organizations which promote employment opportunity or belong to businesses owned by persons with disabilities themselves. And Thailand has been doing that for a few years now. We're still uh, on our way to make revision to our public procurement law to put accessibility as one of the requirements. And then we also, in the process of our institutional reform to create the uh, interministerial body to create the accessibility board to take the job of compilation of standards, adoption of new standards, and enforcing, promoting the standards, working hand in hand with the, hopefully, uh, the new revision of the public procurement law. And by saying that, I have to remind you to go back and read the publication by UNSCAP. And please give a big round of applause to you and Escap again for being champion on this in our region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Montian. You gave us what's the paradigm of accessibility. It, I think it is a, one of the important things. I will move on to uh, Mr. Uh, P.T. Lee. Uh, can you outline three priorities? Uh, areas of uh, for collaborations between ESCAP and ASEAN to facilitate implementations of disability inclusive development in the region with full participations of people with disability, especially OPDs. Please, time is yours, five minutes. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I can only draw uh, experience from our recent uh, involvement with the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan 2025 towards a disability inclusive community. The ASEAN Disability Forum is a community of OPDs in the, in the 10 ASEAN countries. We represent about 30 million uh, persons with disabilities, their caregivers, as well as the OPDs that they come from. And we are very privileged to be an accredited uh, CSO by ASEAN uh, since 2018, 2017. And uh, because of this, we were very deeply involved with crafting and making sure 
uh, that the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan uh, contains and accurately reflects the needs and aspirations of persons with disabilities. So reflecting back on, on your question, Madam Moderator, I feel that uh, a few things uh, that we need to rethink really about very carefully is, number one, I think we need to involve persons with disabilities, their caregivers, as well as the OPDs that they, that they come from, right from the very beginning in the whole process, in the whole process of, uh, of uh, determining the direction of the fourth decade of, of, of the uh, Asian and Pacific decade of persons with dis disabilities starting from 2023 to 20, uh, 2032. Because only when we, became, when we can start from the very beginning and get involved with it, uh, definitely uh, we can make an impact and we can make sure to help shape uh, the direction in which this decade could go. Number two, uh, I feel that uh, we, can be, we can be part, as I said earlier, about this community of people who are concerned about moving this decade forward into the, into the, into the fourth, 40th year. And I think we have many stakeholders involved in this process. Uh, we have not only uh, uh, OPDs, but we also must remember the four Ps, the public, private, the public, private, and uh, I forgot the last one. <laughs> yeah, and the, the, the partnership that, that I think is very important because it helps to create a synergi synergistic approach. And I think this way, I think persons with disabilities and their organisation can be very actively involved uh, uh, in, in shaping uh, how the new decade is going to be. Thirdly, I feel that I think we need to put in place uh, a, a monitoring and evaluation uh, system whereby the directions of the, the goals, the targets, the, the activities of the uh, decade can be constantly reviewed and make sure uh, that we are in the right direction. One of the hallmarks of the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan is that we have put in place um, a midterm review and with that midterm review we actually looking at the structure in which the baseline um, the baseline the facts have been gathered as to how far countries within ASEAN are moving with towards the 76 action points that have been uh, uh, encraft, encap, encapsulated in the ASEAN enabling master plan so involve persons with disabilities in the monitoring and evaluation uh, of this decade that is coming about Lastly, I think we need to have a mechanism for feedback. Periodical feedback, because that is important to address any gaps in services, any emergency, emerging new needs. I think reflecting back on the last two and a half years, where, where the whole world, including ASEAN, was, was ravaged by the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And I think we are still uh, uh, struggling to get back on our, on our feet as far as uh, this pandemic is concerned. And the impact on the employment of, of, of persons with, with disabilities and the right to earn a living, the education of persons with disabilities, uh, whether in, in, uh, in special education schools or, or in institutions uh, that are out there, we find that a lot of disruption mm. and the need for us to go this direction. So, so there's always this... Uh, new challenges that's coming up. I don't, I don't think uh, the pandemic will be the first, neither will it be the last to hit this world. So we need to be very sure that we have this mechanism whereby we, we have this feedback. And someone suggested, uh, my dear friend Sawalak suggested that perhaps uh, uh, ASEAN could set the ball rolling by appointing uh, a commissioner for disability, okay. whereby disputes always can be can be addressed. Okay, thank, thank you, you uh, Mr. Piti Lim. Uh, I think three important points. Uh, uh, the time is running, so uh, I will move on to uh, Mrs. Sunita. It's the last part of uh, panelists. Uh, what are some of the innovative uh, initiative that you have seen emerging in the private sector to contribute to disability inclusive development. Please, time is yours, sure. not more Thank than you, five Nuke. minutes. Thank you, Dr. Nuke. 
Uh, let me start by giving a few examples from Wipro, the company that I've uh, worked for the last 27 years. Uh, to start with, I think this is something which is a conversation that has to start from the top. There is no point in uh, lower level stalking disability when the CEO and the board doesn't really believe in it. So point number one, I think we need uh, advocates right from the top. Uh, two, I think a lot of times what we've seen is that you decide what role the person with disability can do. And that's a conversation I was having with Senator Montian right now to say that it is not that we are looking at the lower kind of jobs to go to people with disability. It is all jobs. Any job in the IT segment is equally open for anybody irrespective of whether they have a disability, gender, ethnicity, whatever. It is, so it's more a person-centric approach where we say, by doing just simple things is the stickability, right? So if I really look at the mass of people who I have uh, with a disability, and by the way, these are all self-declared. So the third thing is psychological safety. For me to stand up and say, yes, I have a disability, and this is the kind of reasonable, reasonable accommodation that I would require from the organization to support me. So as long as you've created the environment which is truly inclusive, wherein it's it, irrespective of whether you have a person with disability or not, I think the culture in the organization is one of truly being inclusive rather than looking at this as a metric. Obviously, what we've seen is the level of engagement that we have from our people with disability, because if I just take a cross-section of my employee experience surveys, the level of engagement, the level of interaction, the level of commitment to the company is far higher when we've brought them onto the same table and we are seeking their inputs in terms of changes that we would like to bring. So the employee resource groups that have been created are fabulous in terms of suggesting what other innovative practice the company can really adopt. If I were to just look outside of Wipro, of course, uh, like again, Santa Montin was saying, there are a lot of companies in the US specifically who've created a lot of innovative things. So for example, if I just look at the, the AI that Microsoft is talking about, you know, where irrespective of your visual impairment, or if I look at Google, if I look at Zoom, all of them have come up with innovative technologies to assist people either with a visual impairment or with cognitive disability or with hearing impairment. And this, I think, is important because it just uplifts everyone. It, 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 because people, of course, people, there are people who are born with a disability, but you never know. It, it could be just one accident tomorrow that could get you onto the other side. So I think the awareness that we're all in it together and not letting only the people with disability figure out how to do things is important. So I think it's, it's the inclusion of all which will help you build those innovative practices in those private sector companies, which will really do good, not just for the people with disability, but for the overall organization. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Sunita. Uh, some point that's really important for all of us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we still have one uh, lady uh, as a discussion. Uh, here is a doctor. Uh, Bernadia Irawati Chandra Devi. She is uh, the first woman Secretary General of United Cities and Local Government Asia Pacific uh, or UCLG uh, ASPAC. Uh, time is yours. Unfortunately, only three minutes. <laughs> Please. <laughs> it's fine. The Excellencies, Moderator, Chair, speakers, panelists, and participants. A very good morning and uh, selamat pagi. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Maybe like Sunita, uh, maybe I'm the only uh, representative from local governments here. Uh, and, and I'm very pleased uh, to be invited. It's really an honor for me to speak uh, at this high level uh, government meeting on the topic uh, that is close to us, of course. And thanks to uh, Minister of uh, Social Affairs, Burisma, and she actually um, served as the president of this organization uh, when she was the mayor 
of Surabaya a couple of years ago. That's why uh, we perhaps, uh, because on the reason we, we were invited uh, to speak in this uh, panel. And um, I don't need to explain uh, how important uh, this local constituency that I'm representing, uh, local governments uh, and the associations. And when we look at the global agendas, uh, almost 65% uh, of the sustainable development goals uh, must be uh, carried out or implemented at the local level. And when we talk about all the services that uh, we have been discussing uh, today, that's related also to public transportation, uh, health services, education services, and whatever services, those are the responsibilities uh, of local governments. Therefore, for us, uh, as um, one of major stakeholders group of the United Nations uh, local authorities, uh, in which uh, UCLG uh, represents almost 240,000 uh, cities and local governments in more than 140 countries, this has been very important aspect in how we promote uh, disabled inclusive development. And um, there are many um, already good practices and um, good practices or best practices that local governments have been implementing. And uh, this also includes uh, several uh, countries that have uh, very high level decentralizations like Japan, South Korea, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Several have allocated uh, resources. Uh, that include also uh, city like Baguio or uh, Semarang that have also um, put some budget allocation for people with uh, disabilities. And also they come up with the monitoring and evaluations because if we want to embrace people with disabilities, we have to make sure that accessibilities are there. So I'd really like to echo what uh, Senator uh, from Thailand mentioned and also uh, other speakers. We have good policies, we have good regulations of uh, job employment for PWDs. Is, uh, PWDs, uh, disabled, uh, but sometimes the environment of these uh, offices on the buildings are not comfortable for uh, people with disabilities. That's why some are higher, but normally in some cases they don't continue the contracts. That's we have seen this uh, in our also um, stories when we talk with uh, people with disabilities. Therefore, for the best practices, good practices that we have uh, in Asia Pacific, we have been disseminating this uh, among um, all the local government associations. In Indonesia, there are almost six or seven local government associations. And for us, these um, city administrations with good leadership they have also been implementing those uh, human rights uh, cities approach. And yesterday also we heard uh, when uh, the minister mentioned about this um, Kampung Tangu or uh, resilient cities. We have been promoting that as one aspect of uh, inclusive, disability inclusive uh, cities and local governments in the Asia Pacific region. And lastly, um, there are several also uh, initiatives, innovations uh, that these regions also has. One of them is uh, the establishment of the Committee on uh, Humanitarian Development Peace Nexus uh, by uh, province of Gyeonggi in South Korea that has, uh, that has been set up uh, as part of this uh, UCLG ASPAC framework. And there is also uh, the work that we have uh, completed with the Ministry of Home Affairs when the ministry decided to amend uh, this, um, what we call it SPM, uh, minimum uh, services standard, that include also social affairs. So these are just a small examples, and another one also include this uh, participatory uh, budgeting and participatory planning. So my last message is we need to unlock, we need to unlock um, people with disabilities uh, in all aspects, uh, and in, if this can be done, and I'm, I, I can see a lot of strong commitment from all of us uh, who are here, then we can make this uh, people-centered uh, development that we are talking about as a reality, and it's not just a dream. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Bernida. 
uh, I think time is over. Uh, I would like to hand back uh, to Madam Chair, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Nuka, the panelists, for another of her very inspiring sessions this morning, Roundtable 2. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like us all to give a round of applause to the panelists, our moderator. Um, we now, I would now like to invite you to make brief interventions related to Roundtable 2 on the topic of innovative partnerships and engagements of persons with disability. Just a kind reminder, in the interest of time, you have two minutes to make uh, brief interventions and uh, so that uh, we are able to complete the members on the list that I have in front of us. The first speaker to make the intervention is from USA. We have the Special Advisor on International Disability Rights, Ms. Sarah, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope everyone's doing well, and it was a wonderful panel. So to keep my remarks very short and sweet, uh, regarding this topic, one thing I always talk about when it, when it comes to the, the point of disability inclusion and the challenge of us achieving full disability inclusion, we need to understand that it's an adaptive challenge and not, not a technical challenge. And what do I mean by that? When you look at an issue from an adaptive perspective, you need to look at a few different things. One is we need to be having difficult conversations on who and why do we still not see disability be prioritized and valued and brought forward. A lot of times we tend to talk to individuals and sectors that agree with us, but what sectors, what individuals, what factions within the system that we're in understand why is disability not prioritized? Why is it not brought forward? As the Senator mentioned, a lot of people will see accessibility, for instance, as a burden. You see a lot of it, um, spaces where they say, I don't want kids with disabilities in my school. It's going to hurt my kids' education. There's still a lot of this narrative. And we need to have these difficult conversations and address them and really try to see how we can move towards this value-based. Number two is this concept of shared responsibility. Let's, say it, let's take it a step further. And let's actually really create this narrative that everyone has a piece in this when it comes to disability inclusion. And when we say everyone, everyone, whether we're talking about climate disaster, AI, um, woman inclusion, et cetera, and when we don't, it actually is a cost on society. Something that I'm, we're now very much encouraging on is when, talk, when we're talking about, for instance, artificial intelligence, is that, is that sector inclusive of the disability perspective? And when we don't, it actually perpetuates the marginalization of persons with disabilities. Number three is, of course, building capacity. Let's say we move to a world where everyone does have a shared responsibility and they want to do disability work, but let's actually build capacity. But fourth, which is the most important, is the narrative, is the storytelling. Are we telling the right story when it comes to disability inclusion? A lot of times we stop at the point of this is the right thing to do. But it's not just the right thing to do. As was mentioned on the panel, it actually, actually brings value to our society and communities. Accenture came out with a report showcasing that businesses that are inclusive of disability from employment, product, policies, and more helps their profit margins. It's not just the right thing to do. I want us to move, move away from the CSR approach, but move towards companies benefit. We benefit. I always give this really simple example. I was a math major in college. Classmates used to come up to me and say, Sara, what classes are you taking next semester? And I say, why does that matter? They're like, whenever you're in the classroom, the professor becomes a better teacher. This concept of when people are included and we make it accessible and inclusive, everyone benefits. I do want to wrap up with the fact that ASEAN Enabled Master Plan is an amazing example of how it really creates this shared responsibility across the three sectors, social, cultural, political, and economic. It's not just based within the social cultural. And I think as the continuation of the mid-year review and the implementation, and we, the U.S., have supported through our implementing partners, support the Enabled Master Plan, let's take that as an example across the world. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much, Sarah. We will now give the floor to the Vice Minister of Social Solidarity. Wow, that's a good one. Social Solidarity from Timor Leste. Ma'am, you have the floor. Thank you for the second opportunity, Madam Chair. Um, I'm very pleased to be here again and speaking. Uh, I learn quite a lot here from the moderator. 
on the uh, best practices from member states. Uh, I would like to share a little bit of uh, Timor Leste's uh, couple of program that uh, on innovative partnership and the engagement with people with disability. Uh, on the 4th of July, as I said yesterday, uh, Timor Leste has ratified our convention. So with the ratification, government is obliged to continue collaborating with the DPOs to make the right real for persons with disability. So the priority on the horizon is the establishment of our National Council for Persons with Disability to monitor and report on the implementation of the CRPD. The innovative partnership and engagement of persons with disabilities are considerably important to ensure that the CRPD implementation is closely monitored. At present, the draft of the decree law is being, is being prepared and will be presented to the Council of Ministers this year for approval. Uh, nonetheless, the Ministry of Social Solidarity and Inclusion, which also functions as a secretariat of the DNAP, has laid a strong foundation for such partnership and engagement to ensure that the issue with disability are mainstream into our planning and budgeting. In 2022, the government has allocated almost 45 million for the implementation of the DNAP across 11 line ministries. Of the 30, 45 million, 30 million of this amount was for the development of water supply and sanitation, as well as the universal coverage of the expecting mother and children as a way of fighting the poverty, malnutrition, and stunting in the country. There are also more than 9,000 persons with disability covered by our social subsidies in 2022. This year, the ministry is also providing financial support to seven out of 29 social solidarity institutions to deliver the care and assistance for persons with disability, including running community-based rehabilitation programs in the country. The ministry- Just a kind request, ma'am, can you wrap up? Thank the you. ministry has also worked together with the Secretary of State for Social and Communication to set up two community registration for persons with disability, which was launched in 2021. The government also uh, has a national rehabilitation center, and also we provide services approximately to 5,000 persons with disability in the country. Finally, there is also um, government provided opportunity for the higher education in the Department of Social Inclusion in the country. Um, this year, the enrollment around 300 students enrolled at the higher education. In 2021, there was one student graduated from the department. All of these efforts manifest the commitment from Marshall Islands, the Chief Executive Officer for Marshall Islands Disabled Persons Organization, to take the floor now. Thank you. Oh, she's Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Warm greeting to you all. I am a disability with mobility and vision, and a chief executive officer for Mid Mazalan and Disabled Person Organization for Midpo. Everything is possible in terms of partnership, present partnership. 10 years until now, MIPO stand for the rights of persons with disability in the community. I'm happy to say that MIPO is member of National Human Rights Committee, member of board of director of the Mazal Island Council of Non-Government Organization, member of National Disability Working Group to lead the International Disability Day on December 3rd in every year. Thank you to US CAP and United Nations for the CRP. I would like, I would like to recognize and appreciate my fellow regional and internal partner who make our rights real. Pacific Disability Forum, Human Rights and Social Division of the South Pacific Commission, 
Japan in Beijing, U.S. in Beijing, Taiwan, ROC in Beijing, major auto local government, Church of the Liturgy, Leader, uh, Church of Jesus Christ and the Liturgy Saints, Church of Salvation Army, special education program and the standard at the public school system, Minister of Health and Human Services, Minister of Culture and Internal Affairs, Minister of National Resources and Commerce, Ministry of Ministry of Work, Infrastructure and Unities, Migration Legal Services in Cooperation. Nothing about us with us. United, we stand for our rights. Thank you, Disability Organization Partners, the Flores Association, they are advocating the right language, sign language everywhere. Mother and Special Parent Association, they stand for the right of their children with disability. May God bless you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We now give the floor to Turkey, and we'll hear from the Director General of Services for Persons with Disabilities and Elderly, Ministry of Family and Social Affairs. Ma'am, you have the floor. Honorable Chair, distinguished participants, I'd like to thank all the panelists for their valuable contributions and interventions. I would like to talk about our partnerships as ministry with diverse institutions and dis in disability area. Our 2030 barrier-free vision document was prepared with the contributions of public institutions, local governments, academics, and CSOs working in the field of disability. Participation of persons with disabilities in the decision process is adopted as one of the basic principles of barrier-free vision document. The preparatory work of the third three-year national action plan of the barrier-free vision document was carried out with a participatory approach. The structure of monitoring and evaluation board for the rights of persons with disabilities, which was established as the coordination mechanism stipulated by the CRPD, was revised with a presidential circular in 2021 in order to ensure that CSOs will be involved more effectively. In this way, we ensured that the representatives of two umbrella confederations with the highest representation power in the field of disability take part in the board as members. CSOs and local governments are also included in the Accessibility Monitoring and Inspection Commissions, which were established in all provinces to mon monitor and inspect accessible practices in order to increase the participation of persons with disabilities as equal individuals in social life. In addition to this, we carry out social inclusion project for persons with mental disabilities with World Health Organization, projects with UNICEF to establish the family-based national early intervention program, activities with UNHCR in order to develop and expand our daycare services, especially to include Syrians under temporary protection, activities for sharing the developments and experiences in our country in the field of disability with Organization of Islamic Cooperation member countries. I believe that our efforts on national level will be strengthened with international cooperation in order to realize a world where persons with disabilities are all inclusive in every sphere. The Ministry of Family and Social Services of Turkey has strived to provide equal opportunities for Can every individual you to round up your and statement? works closely with stakeholders in national and international level. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now have the delegate from China making his interventions. I give the floor to China now. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, am I audible? Yes. You are Okay, thank heard. you. Uh, thank you for thank you, Madam Chair, for giving me the floor. And I would also like to thank all the panelists and the delegates speaking this morning for their inspiring uh, intervention. However, I would like to bring to the attention of the chair the reference made repeatedly by Marshall Island to the so-called Republic of China Taiwan, which China firmly opposes. The standard terminology of the United Nations on this issue is Taiwan province of China. There is only one China in the world, 
Taiwan is an inalienable part of the territory of China, and the government of the People's Republic of China is the sole legal government representing the whole of China. The One China Principle represents the universal consensus of the international community and is consistent with the basic norms of international relations. Madam Chair, this high-level meeting focuses on the final review of the Asian and Pacific Decade of Persons with Disabilities with the aim to promote accelerated efforts towards realizing all goals of the Asian strategy and advanced disability inclusive development. We invite the chair to call on member states to focus on the theme of the event, respect standard terminology and the practice of the UN and avoid politicization of this platform, which is mandated for economic and social development cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, your observations and concerns are noted, uh, Delegate from China, and I ask upon the Secretariat to take note of that. Thank you very much. We will now have uh, the chairperson, of, uh, chairperson for Disabled People's Organization of Bhutan taking the floor. Bhutan, you have the floor. Uh, <clears throat> what the name? Madam Chair, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have been following international movements since 1981, and until now I find it's very interesting and sometimes even confusing. Because even when you define, explain, and interpret, disability seems to be quite uh, complex. For instance, uh, one type of disabilities challenge is not always the case with the other one. For, uh, therefore, I think when we make plans, policies, and whatever we do, we have to be, rather than making one disability blanket terminology, I think it's important to uh, interpret it and put it in proper context. For example, uh, when you talk about accessible toilet, I think we are really talking about someone in wheelchair because if you are a person with blindness, it really doesn't require. And when we're talking about uh, communication, I think people normally think of uh, sign language, whereas for blind people or in wheelchair, uh, you don't need sign language. So therefore, when we make plans or policies, I think we have to be able to inter interpret it properly. From my perspective now, in innovative, if you think of four concepts that have been widely used and then recognized by international organizations, like disability equality training, which basically means using lived experience to uh, advocate, to plan, and monitor, I think is a very good instrument. The next one is twin track approach, which basically means while you are making plans and policies, you also prepare the ground and advocate the users as well as stakeholders. The third one now in the UNCRPD, you have given reasonable accommodation and the fourth one, uh, universal design. These four concepts, if you use it properly and imp interpret it in a proper context based uh, while using uh, appropriate- Delegate from Bhutan, I will ask you to use. wrap up your statement, so, please. Uh, I think this thing will solve your problem. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, five more speakers, and given the time limitations, we will request the uh, speakers to be very brief in the intervention so that we can have uh, all the speakers presenting. We now move to the chairman of the subcommittee on access rehabilitation advisory committee from Hong Kong, who will be joining us via Zoom. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Madam. Thank you for allowing us promotion of universal access public private partnership and engagement of people with disabilities. The Hong Kong government attaches great importance on developing inclusive environment. As the chair of a committee comprising persons with disabilities as key members dedicated to advising and collaborating with the Hong Kong government on promoting accessibility, I am delighted to share with you today a number of progress highlights on the promotion of universal accessibility through public-private partnership and engagement of persons with disabilities. Speaking of accessibility, Hong Kong has a design manual, a barrier-free 
access issued by the government's building authority. For strengthening accessibility, the government's building authority is supported by a technical and advisory committee with members from building professionals, the private sector, academics, persons with disabilities, who all help to review and enrich the design manual from time to time. I'm also pleased to underline a consultancy study for enhancement of accessibility of the physical environment in Hong Kong. This has been a two and a half year project well, which provides a roadmap for us to enhance universal accessibility for the next decade for Hong Kong. This project was completed this year with the participation of people with disabilities who conducted over 160 site visits throughout Hong Kong. This study has undertaken with professionals and evidence-based examination on universal design. As a follow-up, proactive work has been started to forge government collaboration with professional associations, private sectors, as well as higher education institutions for providing courses and programs that touch upon universal design. We are committed to bolstering sustainable pragmatic measures, and we are continuing with practical multi-sectoral partnership to make the right real and to comply with Article Number 9 on the accessibility of the CRPD. We also look forward to the next decade of people with disabilities in Asia Pacific and to much. working with you and SCAP. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The floor is now for the rep delegate from UNICEF, the program specialist children with disabilities. You have the floor, UNICEF. Inclusion policy and strategy to guide the organization's global work on disability in both programmatic areas and organizational systems and processes. The strategy is linked to UNICEF's strategic plan and to the UN Disability Inclusion Strategy. It outlines UNICEF's priorities in relation to children with disabilities and provides a strategic direction and framework for accelerating disability inclusive programming and results. The Disability Inclusion Policy and Strategy, or DPAS, establishes a comprehensive framework for achieving UNICEF's ambitious vision of a more inclusive world by the year 2030. The DPAS describes a set of programmatic and organizational strategies undergirded by meaningful partnerships, which UNICEF must undertake to ensure that by the year 2030. These include Number one, children with disabilities are empowered and recognized as their best advocates. Two, they receive the support they require across the life course to live independently and be included in communities. Three, they grow up in enabling environments with access to resources and opportunities to realize their full potential. UNICEF commits to the ambitious aims and the bold vision described in the document and to working with its partners in this endeavor. At the same time, UNICEF recognizes that this vision of an inclusive world cannot be achieved in isolation. It must be grounded in partnerships with organizations and networks of persons with disabilities. And UNICEF allies in government, the donor community, the private sector and civil society at all levels. We look forward to continuing catalyzing our coll collective efforts and synergies to deliver on the promise of a better, more prosperous future for every child. Thank you and wishing a good continuation of the meeting. Thank you, thank you very much. We have the second last speaker from the Pacific Disability Forum of the Pacific. You have the floor. Please stick to your time so we can finish the other speaker on time as well. Thank you, Madam Chair, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. I am Vilani Bangsal from Palau and attending this important event representing the Pacific Disability Forum as co-chair. We acknowledge organizations of persons with disabilities who have been making valuable contributions at Incheon for the successful implementation of the strategy over the past three decades. However, the attitudinal and environmental barriers continue to exclude persons with disabilities from fully and effectively participating in society on an equal basis with others. 
Therefore, we persons with disabilities want to highlight the following as we prepare for a new decade. Partnership built at the core of leave, of leave No One Behind principles is key to progressing development for persons with disabilities in the post-COVID world. Consideration for the meaningful engagement and participation of persons with disabilities in government policies and programs, partners' initiatives, donors' investment, both bilateral and multilateral. Whether it's disability-specific intervention or investment that is meant for the general population and mainstream programs. It's also very important that the UN agencies who are intergovernmental bodies and partners on the ground continue better their work at the regional and national levels. We affirm such preconditions to inclusion for persons with disabilities are necessary to achieve the Jakarta Declaration and Intern Strategy. Diversity and the specific needs of persons with disabilities need to be recognized and their interconnectedness. Our equity issues must also be brought to bear alongside our inclusion if the soon to be four decades of addressing the concerns, dreams, and aspirations of persons with disabilities in our region are fully realized. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now move on to our last speaker for this session, and she is the co-chair Asia-Pacific Women with Disabilities Network, Ms. Abia Akram. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, for giving me the opportunity. Disability rights are human rights, and we have truly acknowledged the contributions of the state representatives and the organizations of persons with disabilities and the UNHCAP for their continuous support and the commitment. We, when we talk about tracking the opportunities and the issues, it is the right time to talk about the intersectionality between the diversified movements, the diversified stakeholders, the diversified government and the entities. When we talk about the budgetary allocation, we need to check how justified it is to support the rights of persons with disability. When we talk about the inclusion of organizations of persons with disability, we need to check how meaningful participation we have of the representations and the organizations of persons with disability. We also need to see the policies and the legislative reforms in a way that UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities truly reflected, not only in the disability policies, but the UPR, VNR, and the implementation of the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals. We cannot wait for another decade to see the change. This is the time we have to take all the practical strategies join hand together with all the stakeholders so we can make sure persons with disabilities are living a dignified life and we have truly inclusive development. Thank you. Thank you very much. Distinguished uh, excellencies, distinguished delegates, uh, I see no more speakers li left on my list. I'd like to once again thank the moderator, the panelists, and delegates for such a lively discussions and all of you present for this roundtable discussions. I know lunch is just in a few minutes. Before we adjourn for a break and reconvene at uh, 2 p.m. Jakarta time to continue our deliberations under agenda item three, I would like to invite the secretary to provide some housekeeping on announcements. Thank you very, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I, I would just like to remind delegates about the two side events that are scheduled from 12.30 to 1.40 p.m. today, two of which are hybrid, one being held in the room next to you in Grand Ballroom 3, which essentially is bringing the hope of Inch on 2012 to Jakarta 2022, which brings together the SCAP uh, promoters and champions for the last decade, and you'll hear, listen to some very, very inspiring stories there, and the disabled, also uh, done in partnership with the uh, Disabled Persons Organization of Bhutan. Then we have another side event, which is upstairs, which is also hybrid, which is organized by Prospera and the Indonesian National Disability Commission, on the high, which is on the potential of quotas to advance the employment of people, persons with disabilities, which is also a very focused. Uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. And as usual, lunch will be on the third floor. I'm sure you're waiting to rush to lunch before attending these interesting side events. Over to you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Excellencies, distinguished guests. It was a pleasure being your chair. And as we 
uh, adjourn for lunch. I would like to wish you all the very best in your deliberations in the coming days and a safe journey back home till we meet again. Thank you. God bless. Recording stopped.
Thank you. 
Hello. Um, good afternoon. Um, may I ask um, if any delegate would like to test your connection? You may click uh, raise hand button. Uh, yes, I see Professor Obato uh, promoting you to the panelist. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, uh, Professor Ovanto. Would okay. you mind switch on your video so we can test your connection, please? Yes, I can see you very well, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So my connection is all right, okay? Yeah, your connection is good. Thank you. The uh, session will start in about 20 minutes, so please be on standby. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, uh, John. Are you there? Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. I, I got the information that one of the panelists on this session will do the sign. Okay. Is on it the for intervention? Yeah. Yes. Uh, no, she's the panel member. She's one of the panel member and she will do the sign. But I'm checking if she's going to do the Bahasa sign language or international sign language. If um, she do. Yeah, do the international sign. This is the yeah, from SDD. Yeah, oh, she will do the international yes, sign. Yes, she will do the international sign. Okay, okay. Yeah. And also, John, we have shared uh, with Samuel and Amarash the, uh, her talking points already. Okay. Yeah. Um, probably we will have...
podcast.
Excellencies, yeah. Excellencies, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, I trust everyone has enjoyed the side events and have been refreshed over the lunch break. The meeting is now called to order. We will now continue with agenda item three. Distinguished delegates, we will now move to round table three, emerging issues and opportunities. Again, this round table will feature a panel discussion followed by interventions from the floor. I now have the pleasure to invite Ms. Wendy Walker, Chief of Social Development Thematic Group, Asian Development Bank, to moderate the panel discussion under this round table. Ms. Walker. Thank you, Madam Chair, Excellencies, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be here today to participate, and my thanks to UNSCAP and the Government of Indonesia for hosting this important meeting. As we've heard in the earlier sessions, in response to the COVID-19 crisis, many governments in Asia and Pacific introduced policy and program actions to meet the increased needs of persons with disabilities in accessing health care, information and communication technology, social protection programs, and other services. And while the temporary measures have alleviated the COVID-19 shocks to some extent, the pandemic has also compounded some of the pre-existing disparities. But it's also highlighted issues and opportunities for moving forward disability inclusive development across areas such as digital inclusion and accessibility, productive employment and decent work, social protection, and disability inclusive disaster risk reduction. The many good practices and lessons have been learned over these past few years and they reveal the importance of investing in these areas, preparing for future crises, and promoting cross-sectoral and coordinated approaches that ensure that persons with disabilities will not be left behind. Our panel today will focus on some of the forward-looking policies and strategies for disability-inclusive development and highlight emerging regional issues and opportunities. So with that very brief context, let's start. We have a wonderful and diverse set of panelists who I will briefly introduce as we go along. Um, I'd like to ask each to please try to keep to your time. And I'll start first with Alex Cote, who is the Disability and Social Protection Social Policy Specialist at UNICEF. Alex, I hope you're online. Um, what are some of the new developments regarding social protection for persons with disabilities in recent years, such as providing a mixture of social protection measures or ensuring compatibility of disability-specific schemes with other benefits? Over to you, Alex. Uh, thank you very much, Wendy, and, and thanks for UNSCAP to, to invite me to participate to this very important event. Apology not to be able to be there um, in person. So indeed, I think we, we have seen in, in the last decade uh, a greater attention to social protection for persons with disabilities. Um, I think uh, in part because of the CRPD implementation, the SDG, and also the, the insurance strategy with more countries implementing disability allowance. And, and a big growth, notably in, in the Pacific region. The mapping we've been doing have shown that there is a greater understanding for the socioeconomic impact of disability-related costs. And um, this has uh, implies moving away from a, a rational for disability support that was mostly focused on incapacity to work to support for inclusion. There has been innovating studies on, on disability-related costs for children or adults, like in Philippines, Indonesia, or Georgia. And we've seen several countries uh, adopting universal disability benefits for children working age adults, and sometimes for older persons, um, with, uh, I would say, uh, a growing trend. It's not yet the majority, but a growing trend to make the disability benefit compatible with work. I think the, there is this understanding that persons with disabilities who seek work and, and keep work have disability costs, they are not on an equal footing with people without disabilities, and there is need of, of social protection support to compensate and ensure that they have the support they need to engage uh, in, in economic uh, activities. I think there is some, still some resistance with, uh, for instance, this, this sometimes focus on no double dipping, which limits, I would say, the effectiveness of, of social protection support by not allowing uh, compatibility with benefits. 
Some countries have done it, and where we see, for instance, compatibility of disability benefit with poverty assistance, uh, with old age pensions. So it is, it is moving, and I think there is an emerging trend. I think there is also a, a, a greater understanding that cash is not enough, and that there is a need for greater access to healthcare and assistive technology. Here, I'm sure you, you heard that in other session. I think there has been quite a lot of progress in terms of, um, um, of uh, awareness and, and, and schemes. I think there are still some elements where we need more like point-to-point -point transport, human assistance, and then we'll talk maybe about it a bit later. But none of this can be done if there is not a good national disability identification and certification mechanism. And here I have to say that we've, we've we see countries really trying to move from the medical model of disability to a more human right-based approach to disability, to go beyond impairment as, as the sole element that is assessed. There is some work still to be done, but there are great innovation. And I think um, digitization has proved to be uh, a game changer. Um, it, it allows for assessment to be more comprehensive and to be done at the local level, which is very important. We see in too many countries still, there is uh, emphasis on medical assessment, which is a uh, create barrier to access and limit the amount of information that governments are, are, are collecting. But we've seen, for instance, in Cambodia, the, the emergence of a disability uh, management information system um, which makes it more accessible, more reliable, and more comprehensive, and that are proven to be very effective, for instance, in uh, providing support during COVID-19. So I would say uh, we are really halfway uh, towards the, the inclusive social protection system we want to see, but definitely in the last decade, we have seen a great change in, in the region. Over. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. So while progress has made Clearly, this is an evolving area with critical areas for engagement and collaboration, such as development of better data and identification systems and improved access to health and care services, AT, uh, transport and housing. Um, now, let me turn to my friend, uh, Luisa Manufetoa, who is Deputy Chief Executive Officer of Social Protection, Disability and Vulnerables at the Ministry of Internal Affairs in Tonga. Uh, Luisa, can you please introduce Tonga's experience in advancing disability-inclusive disaster risk reduction, especially the use of cash transfers to assist persons with disabilities in natural and biological hazards? Thanks, moderator. The first experience I want to share from the government experiences in Tonga is the diversity of the person with disability needs their level of difficulties and appropriate costs needed to sufficiently empower them to pursue their life opportunities. We started off with cash assistance in 2015 with $65 per month. And during the seven years we worked with disability inclusiveness, we increased the amount four times. And by 2020, um, with making sure that everyone are not left behind, we categorize them to mild, moderate, and severe, and costs were adjusted accordingly. We are learning as we go along with the um, uh, best fit for our person with disability, and we realize that one size fit all is not applicable with person with disability. However, it is very important for us to make sure that we do this right, because uh, without them for today, we are making the real rights for person with disability if we are making sure that we scrutinize them and uh, categorize them accordingly and no one is left behind. The second experience I want to share this afternoon is the approach <coughs> taken to select <coughs> person with disability. Uh, the first time that we started with the um, inclusive, disability inclusiveness, we used the target approach targeted approach, which we target only the, the extreme persons with disability, those that are bedridden. And we travel from 2015 up to now, we changed the approach to universal approach. With the universal approach, um, we make sure that everyone is on board, uh, whether they're ailments, uh, um, they're um, 
marginalized function is minor, moderate or severe, they are in. So um, that's the change as we uh, go along with uh, uh, inclusiveness disability. The third experience I want to say is the critical part about making uh, the intervention uh, timely. Uh, I, I believe that most of you have heard about Tonga with the um, volcano eruption. Everyone thought uh, that we are going to um, disappear from, from this world, but that's a mystery. Uh, however, <clears throat> we realized that there are negative coping uh, mechanisms that will enter if we don't do this timely. And, I, and in my experience, it's very important that we deliver, whether it's a fund or psychological approach, uh, approach or um, uh, education, support, it is important to avoid those coping, those negative um, mechanisms. The last one is the close collaboration. Uh, we is very young with social protection, but we realize that um, uh, is, uh, the focal point for social protection in the country, we need the relevant uh, government ministries as well as the faith-based institution, the uh, civil societies, and the development partners. Uh, we need them uh, because uh, uh, addressing the needs of the person with disability is not only limited to fund, but also to education, to sport, hygiene, health, and many, many more. Uh, with that, there are other emerging, um, uh, emerging issues uh, that we will be dealing with in terms of disability and climate change, disability and uh, COVID-19, disability and volcano. But uh, with the time, I'll end here. Thank you, moderator. Thank you, Louisa. So it's very good to see the effort Tonga has made to understand and address the diverse needs and to develop the evidence, collaboration, and planning for better preparation, disaster response, and resilience building. Um, I'm now going to turn to our next speaker, who is Ms. Rakmita Maun Harahap, who is the commissioner at the National Commission for Disabilities here in Indonesia. So Rakmita, can you please share some measures undertaken by the National Commission for Disabilities in Indonesia to address the long-term implications and impact of the pandemic on disability-inclusive development. Thank you to all of you. I would like to talk about the NCD's duties and functions, uh, which is to carry out monitoring evaluation and advocacy for the implementation of respect, protection and fulfillment of the rights of persons with, the, with disabilities. And the function of the NCD's plan is, is, is its effort to respect, protect and fulfill the rights of PWDs. And the advocacy in terms of the implementation of respect, protection and fulfillment of the rights of disabilities includes things such as the implementation of cooperation in handling persons with disabilities with the relevant stakeholders. And in terms of monitoring and evaluation, it's in the, in the areas of implementation of respect, protection and fulfillment of the rights of PWDs. And in the priority issues or priority, a priority areas of NCDs are in education, health, social, employment and data collection. The NCD carries out str several strategic approaches by making constructive solution efforts to all relevant stakeholders and by using various instruments that have been developed as references such as SDGs, the disability rights indicate indicators, data and fact-based analysis, research and studies, input from experts, as well as the process of monitoring, evaluation, and advocacy. And all these are done and carried out proactively by NCD on their own initiative. And the impact of the COVID-19, uh, I will talk about the sectors that have been uh, impacted by the PWDs. On the, in the education sector, the impact on persons with disabilities in, this, it's a, in terms of its learning method that uses applications, app-based apps, and online learnings. And from the assessment that's been made by the inclusive COVID-19 response DPOs network, well, we have seen as many as 
1,683 respondents have participated in the assessment and 16, 7.9% stated that they had difficulties in participation of learning due to the absence of the companions at home or to parents having to work. And in terms of the economic sector, the impact on people with disabilities is in areas in terms of losing their jobs, income decrement, as well as um, the difficulties in meeting their needs. And some of the gaps that we see in the existence of the COVID-19 pandemic is increasingly making it difficult for PWDs to work, to find jobs, because there is still an, an, a gap in terms of inclusion of people with disabilities in terms of infrastructure and services for them to access education, jobs, etc. And some of the steps that have been taken by NCD is in terms of employment will be the, to be in areas such as assisting the Makassar City Manpower and Transmigration Office in the development of the Makassar City Disability Service Unit. And the employment sectors and assistance to the East Java Province Manpower and Transmigration Office. And this resulted in, a, in the establishment of the employment DSU so that people with disabilities affected by COVID can be trained in skills for jobs in the future. And secondly, in collaboration with the Civil National Cap Capital, CNC, Bank Rakyat Indonesia, and Telkom in providing employment opportunities for people with disabilities. And thirdly, encouraging the Indonesian Employers Association to employ people with disabilities with prior assessment in accordance with the abilities of the of the PWDs. And in the results of the data collection has integrated on the integration of the data collection that has been carried out by the NCD, is a, is it is it is a successful advocacy for driving license, which quote for the SIMA and C to the National Police Chief, specifically for the deaf who are victims of SIM making frauds. The achievements were initiated by collecting data of from the victims and succeeded in obtaining, which succeeded in obtaining a driver's license for the victim. The Chief of Police advocacy has proven fruitful by the issuance of the Chief of Police's letters letter on the on September 9, 2020, regarding the issuance of SIMA and C for the deaf. In terms of education, we have conducted socialization to, to, for higher education institutions to be able to provide education rights for persons with disabilities and encourage the existence of disability service units within the universities and to pro provide input for the appropriation appropriate accommodation for students and secondly in advocating on affirmative scholarships for people with disabilities at one of the LDPP institutions a government owned institution that provides scholarships so that people with disabilities who are econ economically affected by covid need not worry that they are able to continue to obtain higher education And secondly, on, on how on, and B on how governments in partnerships with civil society governments are leveraged on the opportunities. I will speak about that in a bit. But on I this think issue, that's the second that's, question. Yeah, that's on the second question. So on the first question, so, so, I will now conclude to talk about the driving license that I've mentioned about for people with disabilities which have been given to them, the same A and B, which was not given to them initially. And I would like to also to mention in terms of the, the, the six and the September 6th incident, incident, which talks about the issuance of SIM A and C for the death that was successfully achieved. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And thank you for listening.
So thank you for highlighting the key areas of impact on persons with disabilities in Indonesia and the important role of the NCD in developing and tracking the evidence, developing new programs in areas like employment and education, monitoring and advocacy. Um, let us now move to Mr. Wong Yung Long, who is the Executive Director for the National Council for the, Bi for the Blind in Malaysia. Mr. Long, how can digital inclusion of persons with disabilities contribute to their full and comprehensive development? What needs to be done to advance digital accessibility for persons with disabilities, especially in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond? Over to you. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. So the COVID-19 uh, pandemic accelerated uh, digital transformation, creating more opportunities in many areas. Services that previously were conducted face-to-face -face moved online. For example, in education, remote working, e-healthcare, grocery shopping, e-hailing services, and assessing uh, social protection services. Many persons with disabilities were able to conduct their daily activities online. Uh, previously, they might find it difficult to get a taxi, but now it will be easy for them to use mobile apps to get an e-hailing car, for example. However, digitalization is like a double-edged sword. Persons with disability risk further exclusion if not utilized correctly. Or persons with disability will experience inclusion if we embrace it and take the necessary measures to make digitalization accessible to all. Digitalization is here to stay, whatever we say. We cannot shy away from it, but we have to make it work for our benefit. Thanks to COVID-19, National Council for the Blind Malaysia and CBM, with financial support from SCAP, conducted a project on digital accessibility for persons with disabilities. Through this project, 23 persons with disability received training online on web accessibility and accessible publishing. The trainees are also exposed to gender disability, intersectionality training and strategic advocacy. The graduates now are, able, are actively advocating on various issues faced by persons with disabilities. So, my suggestion here is we must ensure digital access benefits for all, whether disability that are visible or not visible. So, we must encourage multi-stakeholder partnerships between ODPs, government, private sector, and CSOs. Only by working together, we can achieve meaningful progress. I think we heard, it, heard this phrase many times, uh, yesterday and today. There need to be regulations in place that ensure a disability equitable and affordable digital environment similar to guidelines that we already have on accessible uh, public spaces and transportation. So now we have to move, move on to make guidelines on uh, digital accessibility. But this is not too difficult because there are a lot of uh, international guidelines which is uh, available, such as the Web Content Accessibility Guideline and a few other guidelines that we can use as refer reference. We should also tap on artificial intelligence, enable infrastructure, which have great potential in creating better accessibility for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Going forward, this is going to be one of the most critical areas for engagement and advocacy uh, to ensure social and economic inclusion, affordability of, and access to opportunities. So now we can move on to the second round of questions. Thanks everybody for being succinct, but uh, also adding a lot of substance to the discussion. So I'm going back over to you, Alex, um, to follow up on your earlier answer, which highlighted the importance of improving care systems. How can governments enhance support services for persons with disabilities and build a support system for their caregivers? Uh, thank you, Wendy. I think that um, there has been in the region a, a growing attention uh, given to this issue, especially with regards to long-term care for older persons. But the COVID-19 really show that in most countries, there is a lack of publicly funded community care and support systems. And this is connected to the whole debate of the care economy because it's basically also a, a gender inequality issue. And if we look at the effort that have been made in the field of the cash transfer, it's probably one of the weaker points of progress in terms of achievement of the social protection goal of the insurance strategy. Very few countries have, for instance, personal assistance schemes uh, we have Thailand that have been uh, progressively developing this system over the years. Georgia just introduced a, a new scheme. Few countries have also caregiver uh, allowance, like Vietnam or Cook Islands. Um, but it's still, I would say, very nascent. Um, one of the things that is extremely important is that the in the efforts that are made regard to child care or long-term care, we need to have a strong disability inclusion and CRPD perspective to ensure that the focus is really on support to live in the community and not developing uh, residential and segregated care. And we, we have seen emergence huh, for long-term care of a community um, uh, approach supported by the government. And, and it is this balance that is challenging to find. I think that one of the challenges is also figuring out how to increase the support and the care that person with disability needs from childhood to old age without reinforcing gender inequalities, because we know that unpaid care is mostly provided by women and girls. And I think that it requires social innovation. Um, there is no blueprint. We don't know exactly in, in lower setting, uh, lower economy, uh, income settings, how to do that. There is, there is no recipe for it. Um, and it requires, for instance, greater partnership between the public sector and the NGOs and the OPDs. It needs also uh, thinking, how do we integrate cash transfer systems with, for instance, community-based rehabilitation or community-based inclusive development? We are, in, in many countries, you have those two programs that exist but they are not really related to one to another. And I think, for instance, bringing more case management around the deployment of uh, disability assessment and cash transfer can be very helpful because there is also a big issue of, of provider supply side, but financing. How do we find this steady financing and, and this connecting cash transfer with, um, with provision of care and support could be a solution. I think also um, making the most of existing public expenditure, like public works program that exists in many countries, could be used to actually finance community care and support services by including the care work in what can be supported through, uh, through public works. I think that there is also a, a big issue around fiscal decentralization, because we see the responsibility of uh, care and support systems being delegated to local authorities with not always the resources that, that, that are needed to do so. So that I think that finding this balance between central government schemes, local government resources and planning, community resources and uh, NGOs and OPDs is the equation I think it's the equation that each country need, need to solve. We see emerging initiative here and there. The challenges, they are often local and we need this kind of scale up. And, and I do believe that the emergence of disability management information systems that capture better the support needs 
of, of persons with disabilities can be a great tool to build this infrastructure on which those different local initiatives can be plugged, especially if there is universal cash transfer um, that for person with disability that, that reinforce this, this infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. <clears throat> as, I mean, as you've highlighted, as greater attention starts to emerge on the care economy and care services, the issues you outline on expansion, improvement, management, stakeholder coordination, and financing of care services is one of the important challenges going forward from all countries. And it's, uh, um, it's an issue that's coming up in, the, in child care, as you said, also in long-term care and others. Um, Luisa, now if I can turn to you, um, what actions have been taken by the government of Tonga to address the emerging issues and opportunities concerning the disability inclusive development in a coordinated and comprehensive manner? Tonga was hit by two major natural disasters in January this year. First, the volcano eruptions and tsunami that affected 84% of the country. And the outbreak of the COVID-19 that finally reached the shores of Tonga in the same month. In response to, this, to these major disasters, shock response interventions were carried out by the government of Tonga with relevant ministry as well as donor partners, CSOs, and faith-based institutions. Issue number one that we um, notice when all of this uh, being carried out in the country is that, that everyone um, have their own uh, programs and their mandates and one of the main issues that we um, noticed that the government should have a national social protection policy to guide and ensure that the intervention are implemented in a way where it make positive impacts of persons with disability and in the context of the country island. Action taken, social protection policy is now underway uh, with the government of Tonga and also the World Bank and uh, we agree to complete this um, social protection, protection policy in mid-March next, next year and submit to the cabinet. The second issue that I want to um, bring to our attention is that Tonga is amongst the top three uh, countries that is high risk to natural disaster every year. Um, cash assistance and also top-ups have become a regular assistance for persons with disability and the vulnerable, yet these needs need to be uh, formalized as a shock responsive intervention every year. So what the government is doing now, again, we work closely with World Bank in ensuring that there is an adaptive social protection strategy for Tonga, where disaster risk finance emergency fund is made available to deliver top-ups whenever a major disaster happens in the country. Issue number three is the delivering of cash assistance to people on government registry. We find that we always have people coming in, vulnerable people for their needs too, that are not in our current registry where we only have poverty, persons with disability and elderly. So the action that is taking now again with the um, assistance of the World Bank and the government, we are now developing a MI system which are uh, with a social registry that is a uh, plan to have a capacity to take all of our vulnerable persons um, in the MIS, MIS system. Issue number four that we um, notice uh, that is happening um, in the country uh, in the last three years, uh, we know we, we have a, a look at the life cycle uh, and where we uh, who whom are being addressed there, and we find that um, the elderly and the children are missing. Uh, so um, not to the extent where we have a national program for them. So now what we are doing now is we are engaging um, the Asian Development Bank, thanks uh, to Asian Development Bank. They come in and also agree uh, with uh, Tonga on an um, agreement for uh, a project at um, 17 million, uh, an HK system for elderly, which we call the integrated HK system. Uh, where we will be looking at facilities for elderly as well as uh, caregivers allowance. And the other one for children, of course, um, I just, we, we just launched a humanitarian um, cash transfer for our children um, beginning uh, this month. And it will be, again, um, um, that, that's the last round will be in December. So um, those two um, uh, 
uh, population uh, with our life cycles are now uh, being uh, taken care of uh, with the government and also our, our donor partners. And um, I'm, I'm very pleased to, to say that uh, Tonga is quite young, but uh, while our Kingdom Island faced severe hazard, I think opportunities are provided for development, development in all sectors and advancement is progressing steadily. And uh, with the Pacific Faith uh, moderator, they meant bad, but God turns it, turns it for betterment of Tonga and all people. Thank you. Thank you, Louisa. It's very good to hear about the range of work underway and how the pandemic has helped to accelerate efforts to create the building blocks of a comprehensive, adaptive, and life cycle embedded system of social protection in Tonga. Um, now over to you, Rakmita, um, for your second question. How can governments, in partnership with civil society organizations, leverage the opportunities brought about by digital transformation and innovation to advance disability inclusive development? For the question, um, I first of all talk about the, the development of disability inclusion as the key in terms of providing benefits for people with disabilities and for creating equality. Um, this can be done um, because equality is important for the PWDs to carry out their daily life activities. And what NCD has done to be various CSOs, uh, partnerships, is to encourage as well as to provide input uh, to the existing platforms, such as digital tools with input involving people with various types of disabilities so that all persons with different needs and types of disabilities can access and receive the benefits according to their needs and types of disabilities. And on the digital platform is the uh, Hear Me application, which we have done with NCD. And this application helps the deaf in activities, both in public as well as private spaces, and in, the, in terms of carrying out their daily needs of communication with their hearing friends. And this innovation is fully supported by NCD, and the people with disabilities can experience inclusive digital innovation to support their daily experiences and communication needs. And that's important for the communication between the hearing and between the deaf. And thirdly, we also have a digital innovation for assistive devices. And this is namely an adaptive wand, which is actually a device like a probe for the blind, which can be used as an adaptive wand. And whereby the user who's a blind person can recognize the distance or how far a wall is ahead of them and signals them when there's a puddle of water, for example, whenever the stick or the wand touches or comes in contact with water. And, um, and in a situation where emergency arises, the wand or stick will also provide a warning sounds. So this is the function is to reduce the risk of accidents for users who are visually impaired, which for the device of that nature, they are able to provide the signals and emergency um, indicators for the our visually impaired um, PWDs. So visually impaired in, um, PWDs are able to use wand in various situations as a as a means to be aware of their surroundings and of emergencies. And NCD hopes that we will support these digital devices and innovations through the various CSO so that the benefits of this inclusive development for people with disabilities will continue to be experienced and uh, benefited by the people with disabilities in ensuring that they're not left behind and they can have equal access in society. And therefore, we leave no one behind and equality is achieved in our public sphere. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your response highlights a range of opportunities from the new digital apps to assistive technology to outreach with CSOs, awareness and training that need to be better tapped and collaborated on and also supported by governments. Um, finally, your last question, Mr. Lung. Um, the Marrakesh Treaty 
was adopted by member states of the World Intellectual Property Organization to increase access to books, magazines, and other materials for persons with print disabilities. How can the ratification of and accession to the Marrakesh Treaty accelerate disability inclusive digitalization? Could you please share some of NCBM's experience in catalyzing Malaysia's accession to the treaty? Forgot. Access to information is a basic human rights. And persons with disabilities always find this right being violated with no provision of access to information. To most people, Braille is the Braille is how blind people receive information by reading with their fingers. So do not quickly jump into conclusion because um, in this conference, probably you don't see uh, any Braille or very little Braille at all. That doesn't mean that ASCAP is neglecting the right of persons who are blind in this or with print disability in this uh, conference. Because I'm sure when you go around, you can see most people have various devices where they use to access information. For example, like me having a Braille device, some people using the mobile phone, some people using computers with uh, um, what you call it, screen readers. So one of the achievements of the past decade is the coming into force of the Marrakesh Treaty. And this is something that we all uh, can be proud of. And um, many countries in the ESCAP region has already um, ratified the Marrakesh Treaty. Uh, just briefly for information, Marrakesh Treaty is to provide access to published works uh, in an accessible um, format for persons who are blind, visually impaired, or print disabled. Print disabled is a new um, term that has been, um, what do you call it, included for on, on uh, accessibility. Um, they include people who we talk about, people who with uh, disability who, which is not visible. For those, for example, those people with learning disability, they can also get um, enjoy. Um, the fruits of the Marrakesh Treaty. Basically, what Marrakesh Treaty does is to allow for inf um, information provided in accessible format to be um, excluded from copyright. That means copyright holders will allow uh, such materials to be produced in an accessible format, and that is not a violation. So briefly, I'd like to just share with you um, our journey in Malaysia, how we uh, ratify Marrakesh Treaty. Um, it was not, uh, what do you call it? It was not easy, but it also is, was not difficult. So first, I encourage uh, ODPs to uh, find out who are the people in your country who are in charge of uh, copyright. And um, you have to get in touch with uh, these officers. For example, in Malaysia, we, are, we, are, we have my IPO, which is Malaysia Intellectual Property Organization. So get in touch with your, this organization and uh, explain to them, get them to understand what it means uh, by Marrakesh Treaty, what are the benefits that will be derived from Marrakesh Treaty. And most important, this is a, a, a challenge um, to convince publishers to allow uh, their publication to be produced in an accessible format and to exempt from copyright. Uh, this is not easy. Some publishers might feel that it might uh, cut into their profit margin or, or something like that, I am not sure, but we have to engage. Okay, after you get involved, after you 
get in touch with the organization or the government agency in Malaysia, then we need to do some awareness raising. We need to talk to the important stakeholders who will be involved. For example, the most important one is publishers. Uh, get in touch with the publishing organization and try to explain to them the benefit uh, that the persons with disabilities can get from their action to allow us to exempt us from copyright. And then we must work on amending the copyright law. So we, before we, you, your country can exit to the market treaty, you have to amend the copyright, copyright law so that it allows for exemption uh, for works that are produced for the use of people who are blind and also print disabled. Okay, print disabled, not necessarily blind, as I mentioned just now. So, in Malaysia, we work with the intellectual property organization. Uh, we provided, NCBM provided technical support to them. We explain everything that need, they need to know and uh, what are the amendments needed in the Copyright Act in Malaysia. Um, it's not too difficult because our Copyright Act already provide exemption uh, before the Copyright Act 1987 already provided. So we just need to strengthen it and uh, it was brought up to the cabinet and it was tabled in the parliament uh, last December and um, it was approved and uh, gazetted in February and on 30th of March 2022, uh, we deposited the deed for accession to the Marrakesh Treaty. So Malaysia now is a member of the Marrakesh Treaty and um, you need to work with the organization in your country and um, I wish to thank um, the government of Malaysia and the head of delegation is here that uh, the, what you did and how you support us is very good and we are truly appreciative uh, because it was not a very difficult journey and we didn't face a lot of uh, uh, we didn't face a lot of uh, rejection rejection from the uh, the stakeholders so now with the ratification um, the information can be made accessible we can also can have uh, exchange of information, international exchange of uh, information in accessible format. So what is being produced in uh, country A can be shared with country B if both have ratified the treaty. Okay, let me just um, explain to you simple things like access to information during COVID-19. You might think that it is not difficult for you, but for people with disabilities, this is a new pandemic. We know nothing about it. A simple thing like wearing face masks is a big challenge for persons who are blind because we have never worn face masks before. We have never seen, we have never touched a face mask. Which side the face mask should be facing, inside, outside, we don't know. So, but now, if you make information accessible, we can easily find that out. So that is how we can get ratification of Marrakesh Treaty to benefit the disabled community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that clear example from Malaysia and that last example on the importance of information. But your, your overarching example outlining the importance of the Marrakesh Treaty in supporting access to information and how OPDs can work with government to catalyze both change and improve access. Um, now, in our final moments, uh, let me turn to our discussant, Professor Irwanto from Itmajaya Catholic University in Indonesia, here in Jakarta, and he's also a board of advisor for the Center on Child Protection and Wellbeing at the Faculty of Social and Political Sciences at Universita Indonesia. Um, Professor Irwanto, I hope that you're online, and if you are, um, this is your question. Uh, would you share with us your insight and reflection on our discussion so far? Uh, what should be considered to address the impacts of COVID-19 on disability inclusive development? Thank you. Thank you, Excellencies, participants, ladies and gentlemen, 
thank you for inviting me to be your discussion for round table three. Uh, in response to COVID-19 in the past two and, and a half years, uh, the pandemic has provided us with a lot of lessons learned. Most importantly, our realization that uh, persons with disabilities are among the most vulnerable population that lost their income and li li livelihood and having serious difficulties in accessing government assistance. This is due partly uh, because many of them are dependent on, on the income of other person. In addition to that, uh, with restricted mobility and paralyzed social support institutions and services, many persons with disabilities were at the mercy of their caregivers. And on top of that, available data in the community, including the demographic data, there is often no information about persons with disabilities that uh, somehow make them become invisible and untouchables. The panelists do bring a lot of important issues, highlighting insisting challenges and opportunities for the future of persons with disabilities. Let me address five issues that has been brought up by the panelists. First of all, I believe that accessibility combined with effective legal protection, first and foremost in all sector of the society should be treated seriously because this is still a very serious homework. Any advances in making disability rights real would not be meaningful to many persons with disability without accessibility and effective legal protection. So this should be priority number one in the past, now, and in the future. Available disaggregated data and information has proven to be a critical area on person with disability by gender and by factors of vulnerability. Any advances in our social protection, social economic empowerment, basic rights services program should be able to include the most vulnerable of the vulnerable, the extreme poor, especially those who are not counted in the national demographic statistic because they are not living in the normal household, because they're homeless, and because they are living in isolated communities. I support panelists' view that any kind of social protection program, especially cash transfer, should be addressed as temporary and provided not as a standalone program, especially for the extreme poor. A combination of social protection program uh, especially in the conditional cash transfer and integrated with some kind of empowerment program are important to generate transformative effect. Learning from responding to COVID-19 pandemic, it is very clear that expanding, improving, and coordinating uh, social protection program, increasing the coverage uh, and uh, providing legal protection for that are uh, key for survival. I would like also to highlight the role of digital information and higher learning institutions. Digital technology has been demonstrated to, in, to enable more inclusive and creative intervention and participation in education. Higher learning institutions provide knowledge and the skill for better and dignified job. Unfortunately, many colleges and universities are still discriminatory against persons with disabilities. During our response to COVID-19, digital technology has been very helpful in sustaining participation of all students with disability. Uh, digital technology solution for improving participation uh, should be on the future sustainable development agenda. National representatives to persons with disabilities should comply with the a Paris principles to ensure uh, a real, uh, to ensure a, a significant degree of self-determination -determ and effectiveness in monitoring the rights of persons with disabilities in partnership with the state. And we, Indonesia, has to work seriously on that too. 
Thank you so much. So thank you, Professor Iwanto, for that comprehensive summary and also your ideas on the way forward to accelerate making the rights real and building on the opportunities and innovative efforts that have emerged over the past few years. So with that, I would like to thank all of the panelists for their insightful and substantive discussion, which was also incredibly efficient, and turn back to you, Madam Chair, for comments from the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walker. Uh, take the opportunity to thank Ms. Walker and the panelists. It's been extremely informative, uh, mm -hmm. inspiring, and very helpful panel discussion. Distinguished delegates, I now invite you to make brief interventions related to the topic of emerging issues and opportunities for advance in disability inclusive development. In the interest of time and allowing as many delegates to speak as possible, I request you to keep your intervention succinct, not longer than two minutes each. I will first invite delegates who are present in the room to speak, followed by delegates who request to speak online. For delegates in the room, please put up your name plates if you wish to speak. For delegates on Zoom, please use the raise hand function in Zoom if you wish to speak. Some delegations have submitted their requests to speak in advance. I will first call upon these delegations. Again, due to limitations in time, we will not be able to guarantee a speaking slot for every delegate who requests to speak under this agenda item. We seek your understanding and cooperation, and we hope we can provide an opportunity for every request. I now invite the first speaker on the list, the distinguished delegate from Maldives, uh, Excellency Ms. Ifham Hussain, Minister of State for Ministry of Gender, Family and Social Services. She will be followed by the delegate from USA, Ms. Catherine Bowen-Williams. Honorable Chair, as highlighted by numerous delegates, it is during disasters or crisis we often realize the significance of engaging persons with disabilities in disaster risk reduction measures. The challenges they may face require disability inclusive support systems, yet are marginalized in such situations. Lessons learned from our experiences in tsunami, recent water crisis, and fire incidents have driven us to develop policy frameworks that advocate for and create opportunities to engage persons with disabilities in all areas. We are in the process of reviewing the Disability Act of the Maldives, and the revised act will have new legislative measures that will pave the pathways to systematic involvement of persons with disabilities in all development areas of the country. The geography of the Maldives makes us to think beyond to ensure accessibility of services. Decentralization concept should not only be limited to distributing responsibilities of service provisions within the system levels, Rather, it should be a system that would allow us to share responsibilities and strengthen collaboration amongst key stakeholders. Introducing community-based rehabilitation and community social groups could allow community readiness in making the rights real for PWDs. Engagement of persons with disabilities should be owned not just in the system, but rather each and everyone should value them. It is only then PWDs will be engaged in all aspects of development. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, thank you, Pam. Uh, I now call upon the distinguished delegate, um, Ms. Catherine Bowen Williams from USA, and she will be followed by the distinguished delegate from Malaysia. The United States commends members and associate members of the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific on the progress and achievements made in the decade. Domestically, we have developed and strengthened programs to improve access to disability inclusive development through equitable access to inclusive education, healthcare, employment, transportation, 
housing, and social protection. Under the American Rescue Plan Act, the United States provided increased funds to disability community-based organizations and expanded access to educational programs and supportive services for students with disabilities. The United States also provided increased funding for community-based long-term care to help ensure people with disabilities across the lifespan receive the care they need in their homes and communities instead of institutions or isolated settings. Under the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the United States provided funds to improve accessibility for all riders on rail and other transportation systems. In addition, this law provides funds to develop a robust broadband affordability program that will help people with disabilities access critical services. As part of the Global Disability Summit, USAID committed to concrete actions to support disabled people, including disability inclusion and equity as a cross-cutting requirement of all humanitarian assistance programming, strengthening disability data and evidence for education programming, utilizing best practices and standards, championing disability in inclusive climate action, and supporting disabled persons organizations to respond to the underlying causes of inequality that are worsened by humanitarian emergencies. The United States supports the SCAP in building on existing disability inclusive development <laughs> policy and programs, and we look forward to participating in the future discussions. Thank you. Thank you so very much. <clears throat> I now invite the speaker from Malaysia, the distinguished delegate, Dr. Mazia Sheikh Yusuf, Secretary General, Minister of Women and Family Community Development. Um, Thank our delegate from Malaysia will be followed by the World Food Program delegate. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I would like to convey appreciation to Mr. Wong one of the panelists today for the support and excellent cooperation in together making the progress towards disability inclusive development a reality. The impact of COVID-19 offers an opportunity for Malaysia to review past policies and build back better. This includes avenues to strengthen policies related to three areas, social protection, the employment and digital transformation. On the social security, uh, the national monthly poverty line income was revised from approximately USD 220 to 500 USD per household to ensure that the poverty measurement are in line with Malaysia's socioeconomic development. Beginning January 2021, monthly cash transfers and allowance for eligible people with disabilities have been increased, ranging from 20% to 43%. In, assess, in assisting more than uh, the working people with difficulties whose income were affected by the pandemic, the Social Security Organization has provided an online job seeking platform for PWDs. Job fairs were also help to enable them to seek employment as well as to promote PWD employment incentives offered by the government. In 2020 alone, a total of more than 4,000 PWDs have secured jobs through these platforms. The government has also empowered PWDs through a two-year entrepreneur training programs, whereby more than 1,000 participants exiting successfully from the financial assistance scheme as micro-entrepreneurs. The lockdown situation due to the pandemic has also forced us to adapt to new norms. Digitalization is a solution to ensure continuity in many areas. In education, a digital learning platform known as the Digital Education Learning Initiative Malaysia was established and students with special education needs and their teachers can access applications such as Google Classroom, Google Meet, Apple Teacher Learning Center, as well as digital textbooks, educational videos, and games. During the pandemic, due to travel restrictions put in place under the movement control order, a decline in PWD registration was noted. This has prompted um, the government to initiate the Dr. development Dr. of Masia, online registration. Let me remind you about the time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this uh, initiative has ensured that progress toward disability inclusive development continued despite setbacks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mazia. Um, 
I now invite the distinguished delegate from the World Food Program, Mr. Murali Padmanabham. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for giving this opportunity to talk about one, one another emerging issue of food and nutrition security, which has been uh, another uh, element that is really impacting people with disabilities in a disproportionate manner. Um, looking through the ongoing and the previous pandemic or the other emergency situations, it's high time we ensure equitable access to people with disabilities when it comes to food and nutrition security. As, as part of the advancing of rights of people with disabilities under Article 11 and fulfilling the commitment of uh, SDG number two, we have a kind of responsibility to look at how people with disability have access to food and nutrition, both in emergency and peace situation. And the major barriers of physical access to the system or the communication or the information related to that and how the participation is recognized from the people with the disability and their representative organization is critical here. So what we need to look at is that how we are going to enhance the sensitivity among the people, awareness level, and what kind of capacity one should have to ensure this. Again, how we are going to integrate disability in the whole service and the delivery system of food and nutrition security, how, how every collaborator can come together in ensuring this, and the how of effective community mobilization to address this issue with active participation of people with disabilities and their organizations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I now invite the distinguished delegate from Indonesia Mental Health Institutions, Ms. Yeni Rosa Damianti. Thank you. First of, first of all, I would like to talk about the emerging issues that have not been addressed in the last decade of disability. The first is the, about chronic illness and rare diseases in which the number in the world is a hundreds of millions of people. Next, I would like to talk about psychosocial disability. For psychosocial disability, we have two big problems here. First is unequal recognition before the law. And the second is the elephant in the room nobody would like to talk about, which is the confinement of person with psychosocial disabilities in mental institutions both in medical and medical settings all over Asia and Pacific. Currently, there are hundreds of thousands of people with mental disabilities confined to mental institutions. It is fundamentally against the principles and objectives of CRPD, and it would be a disregard of the slogan of no one left behind and of inclusive development if we do not include this huge issue in the declaration that defined the next decade of disability. Uh, next, I would like to talk about digital technology. To realize barrier-free digital technology, it is necessary for the government to conduct training programs for all types of disabilities, including women and those in the rural area, to be, to be able to use dig uh, digital technology, including digital te technology in the learning curriculum, at inclusive school or as extracurricular activities. To involve disability experts in the development of various digital technology, including various digital applications, including when developing update versions. To create guidelines on digital technology guidelines and to conduct regular audit, audits on digital technology. To ensure the availability of access for persons with disabilities to digital technology. The accessibility referred to above includes access to being able to own equipment that use the technology. Many people with disabilities in Asia Pacific countries live in poverty. How can they enjoy this, this technology if they cannot afford to have even cell phones or computer? Regarding the uh, disaster management, persons with disabilities should be involved in all stages of 
Ah, disaster. Um, Miss Murali, a gentle reminder of the time. Okay. Yes. All aspect of this uh, disaster management must be accessible, including call centers for emergency. Apologies. Following Sendai framework, post disaster development must create a better world for persons with disabilities of all kind of disabilities, both in terms of physical development as well as system and community, uh, community development. Disaster management agency in each countries must have a disability perspective. For that, the state needs to conduct training for officials in this field. Thank you. Thank you. I now invite the distinguished delegate, Mr. Daryal from CBM. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'll cover three points which are which have not been, I think, addressed so far. Uh, the first one is that uh, immediately after the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the instructions to be issued to by the government uh, to the to uh, various uh, uh, stakeholders, uh, that was one. And in India, we had our government uh, department of empowerment of persons with disabilities, which issued the guidelines uh, in um, uh, in collaboration with NGOs like CBM India Trust. We had the uh, guidelines for the government officials, for the carers, for hospitals, how the hospitals should be handling uh, uh, people with disabilities. There were so many issues, which all of you know. The, uh, the, the, the people with disabilities faced maintaining distance and so on and so forth. The second was the data of persons with disabilities and their contact details in the districts. Our Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act provides uh, that uh, every district must uh, you know, uh, compile the data, have details, contact numbers, addresses, etc. Uh, that, I think, is very critical for any disaster. And then third, important how people uh, with uh, some uh, other disability mental health madam said just now uh, my my concern as state commissioner of disability was uh, with respect to people with blood disorder like thalassemia hemophilia and sickle cell disease who could not uh, you know uh, go to the uh, blood uh, transfer blood transfusion because they did not have the passes etc so the instructions Point number one and point number three, these have to be married and it has to be ensured uh, that for any such disaster, we must have the detailed information about uh, every person with disability in the district. And then we should take care and ensure that the people who are not visible uh, around should be taken care of. Thank you so much, Iskab and uh, uh, the, the, the uh, government of Indonesia for hosting this important uh, meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Distinguished delegates, um, I see no more speakers on the list. And I would like to thank the moderator, the panelists, and delegates for the lively discussion. The meeting has now concluded the deliberations on round table three. Thank you. Madam Chair, we'll take one minute to rearrange uh, the rostrum. Thank you very much.
distinguished delegates, yeah. uh, distinguished delegates, we will now move to round table four, tracking progress towards the achievement of disability inclusive development. Again, this round table will feature a panel discussion followed by interventions from the floor. I now have the pleasure to invite Ms. Rodora Turalde Barbara, Director of Human Development, ASEAN Sociocultural Community Department, ASEAN Secretariat, to moderate the panel discussion under this round table. Over to you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Warmest welcome to all our participants to the round table four. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, collecting and analyzing data is critical to understanding the needs of various populations and the impact of policies. However, data availability regarding persons with disabilities is insufficient, raising the risk of persons with disabilities being left behind development efforts. At the global level, only two out of the 10 indicators in the SDGs requiring disaggregation by disability have available data. At the regional level, on the other hand, separate recent analysis conducted by the SCAP and the UNFPA have both found that data availability for the Incheon strategy is lacking, impeding the measurement of progress against the targets and indicators. Therefore, in this roundtable, we will discuss the current status, challenges, and opportunities with regard to disability data and statistics, and other mechanisms to strengthen the tracking of progress on disability inclusive development, in harmony with the spirit and time frame of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Through this roundtable, we aim to address various issues surrounding disability data and statistics, such as inclusion of questions and functioning in censuses and surveys, enhancement of data collection on enablers and barriers to participation in society, as well as the needed support of persons with diverse disabilities, analysis and use of disability disaggregated data to inform policymaking and programming, harmonization of statistical and administrative data on disability, strengthening disability inclusion in voluntary national reviews and SDG tracking, and participation of persons with diverse disabilities and their representative organizations in data collection, analysis, and dissemination. Before we begin with the roundtable discussion, let me thank and warmly welcome our panelists. Our panelists will be sharing their insights and recommendations with regard progress on disability data and statistics, key challenges, opportunities, gaps, and prevalent emerging issues, and establish and emerging good practices and lessons learned. Our roundtable will run for approximately one hour, and I will be posing questions to our panelists one by one in two rounds. I request our speakers to keep their responses to no more than five minutes for each question. So without further ado, let me introduce our first panelist. Mr. Daniel Mont is the CEO and co-founder of the Center for Inclusive Policy in the USA. He has extensive experience in the area of disability and inclusive development in research, operations, and capacity building, having worked for many years with the World Bank, the Washington Group on Disability Statistics, and other development agencies, where he actively participated in developing indicator frameworks for reporting on the CRPD, building disability determination eligibility tools for social protection programs, and establishing education management information systems. Welcome, Mr. Mont, and thank you for joining us online. Given your rich experience in the field, can you tell us what is the importance of including questions and functioning in censuses and surveys, and why is it urgent to collect data on enablers and barriers to participation in society, as well as the support needs of persons with disabilities? Over to you, Mr. Mont. Well, you know, the principle of the Sustainable Development Goals is to leave no one behind. And if, if we're going to you know, fulfill that goal, that mission, we have to be able to collect data in order to, to understand what are the disability gaps? You know, what are the differences in poverty, in, in, in employment, in, education, uh, in educational achievement between people with and without disabilities? And to do that, we have to integrate our, um, 
the, the disability identification questions, questions that can identify people with disabilities into our statistical tools, because only if we do that, can we disaggregate the data and can we compare people with and without disabilities to see where that, that problem is. So there's a whole infrastructure, data infrastructure that's been developed, that's being developed to try to achieve um, uh, the production of all uh, SDG indicators. And if we just include questions like the Washington Group questions um, on, our, on, on our tools, we'll be able to disaggregate all those SDG indicators. We don't need to have a, um, a, a, a new infrastructure. We don't need to, to, to have a, 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 a new set of, 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 of surveys um, in, order to be able, in order to be able to do that. And it, we, we can just include those questions on our existing tools in order to be able to disaggregate. But when we do that, all we're doing is being able to identify what's the problem. Right? What are the disability gaps between people with and without disabilities? How many people with disabilities are poor? How many people with disabilities are, are, are not participating in the labor force? We need to go beyond simple disaggregation to collect data on the environment, on barriers in the environment, because it's only by collecting data on barriers in the environment that we and the supports that are needed by people with disabilities in order to participate that we can craft policies to address those gaps. So the first stage is dis data disaggregation to find out What's the problem? What's the extent of the problem? But then we need to go on beyond that and collect data about the environment so that we can figure out what are the policy levers, what are the um, opportunities for us to actually address and, and fix, those, uh, fix those gaps, close those gaps. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Daniel. So for highlighting that there's actually no need to in, uh, conduct new sets of surveys or uh, put up new infrastructure to have uh, information that would, uh, or data that would inform policy uh, that caters to persons with disabilities. Now, uh, let me invite our next speaker, Mr. Yu Liang, who is also joining us online. Mr. Yu is the Gen Director General of the International Affairs Department of the China Disabled Persons uh, Federation. He has worked for PWDs for the past 25 years and coordinates actions taken to implement the CRPD and the UN Sustainable Development Goals in China. He is dedicated to developing friendly exchanges and cooperation with more than 50 countries. He made efforts in promoting the Asian and Pacific decades of persons with disabilities as one, and was an expert member of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities from 2014 to 2018. Mis uh, welcome, Mr. Yu. Uh, could uh, you please you. elaborate? Yes. Could you please elaborate on the big data platform for persons with disabilities in China, and how can this platform support persons with disabilities in accessing services and inform evidence-based policy making? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Barbara. And also, good afternoon to all my colleagues. Uh, really, it's a good question. Uh, in my opinion, that I believe that to address the problems faced by persons with disabilities, the key is to get to know who they are, where they live, what their life is like, and what they need. It is therefore essential to build a database on persons with disabilities. It is a technical innovation as well as choice of the times. Database on persons with disabilities not only helps to better serve persons with disabilities, but also plays a significant role in national development planning and the policy making. China is home to 85 million persons with disabilities. In 2015, China Disabled Persons Federation initiated the work on nationwide real name surveys on the basic status of persons with disabilities in China and their needs for service. On top of that, any door-to-door surveys on persons with disabilities guarantees real-time information on persons with disabilities. The data 
is uploaded to the database by working staff and updated on annual basis. A national standardized dynamic database is therefore established, serving as an information platform. To this day, basic status information and service needs of three of 37.8 million registered disabled persons has been put into the database. <coughs> Sorry. It is mainly used to reflect their needs in regards of rehabilitation, education, vocational training, social security, cultural and sports life and accessible reconstruction. Meanwhile, special attentions are paid to data management of the needs of women and the children with disabilities. <clears throat> Thanks to the database, more targeted service can be delivered by disabled persons federations at various levels. The set of data collected by CDPF, <clears throat> I mean, China Disabled Persons Federation, has been put into cross-reference with that of other related functional government departments, so as to promote disability-related affairs to be integrated into the overall national development planning, thus promulgating scientific an effective and effectiveness and effective policies and measures, and ultimately realizing leave no one behind. It is best to mention that privacy is on the top agenda when it comes to data collection. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yu. So uh, the experience of China showed us that it is possible to have such a database with, uh, although they call it basic information, for me it was already quite comprehensive and feeds well uh, with the other functional agencies when cross-referenced with other existing uh, agencies' uh, information and data. Um, at this point, let me introduce uh, Mr. Seta Reki Makanawai, or Mr. Seta, the Chief Executive Officer uh, of the Pacific Disability Forum, who is joining us on site. He previously worked as the executive director of the Fiji National Council for Disabled Persons and as the head teacher of the Fiji School for the Blind. He is a keen advocate for disability inclusive development where persons with disabilities and their representative organizations. Mr. Seta has received several awards in recognition of his accomplishments on disability inclusion. Ms. Uh, welcome, Mr. Seta. Um, could you share with us what are some of the effective strategies to strengthen the participation of persons with disabilities and uh, their representative organizations in data collection, analysis, and dissemination? Thank you. Uh, uh, Madam uh, Moderator, uh, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, brothers and sisters with disabilities, uh, I will uh, respond to the question by telling a story from the Pacific and then and hopefully um, provide some in insights on how we have uh, dealt with the question as uh, uh, organizations of persons with disabilities. Uh, since 2015, 10 Pacific, Pacific Island countries have used the Washington Group short set of questions, WGSS, and this um, Fiji, Kiribati, Nauru, Niue, Palau, Samoa, Solomon Islands, Tonga, Tuvalu, and Vanuatu. And six of these countries have either completed or in the process of completing the disability monograph, something I think is uh, relates somewhat to uh, uh, what Mr. Mont uh, earlier talked about in terms of understanding barriers of participation of persons with disabilities. Now the interesting matter here, as I said, in responding to the question by telling this story 
from the Pacific is that organizations of persons with disabilities, including ours, at the regional level, Pacific Disability Forum, and those of our members in the countries that I've referred to, uh, have been actively involved in the process of designing, collection, analysis, and report writing. And this achievement is made possible because we've been working in partnership. Uh, our organization is working in partnership with uh, uh, UNICEF Pacific and the Secretary of the Pacific Community, or SBC. Why we did this more than five years ago is because we want, as persons with disabilities through our representative organizations, we want to be counted and show that persons with disabilities are included in data collection systems at national level. We advocate for the use of tools like what I referred to, WGSS, or the Washington Group's short set questions, and seek te technical assistance from our partners to support our countries that I've referred to through their NSO National Statistics Office, and this is a multi-stakeholder approach. From the design, the, the training of enum enumerators on the WGSS data, data collection stakeholder analysis and the workshop to produce such reports, resulting in the better understanding of data collected and the recommendations that are formulated to help uh, ministries pro improve on their outcomes to, to address the needs of persons with disabilities in these countries. Um, and this has resulted in the, in the designing of appropriate programs and uh, the design of appropriate programs to address the needs of persons with disabilities. An example or case in point, uh, the, that uh, such data was used to form uh, the baseline for the development of social protection uh, programs in Samoa, uh, Kiribati, and Tuvalu. Um, this dissemination of data to stakeholders and making it accessible to persons with disabilities and their organizations can bring about positive change. Thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Seta. So we thank you for sharing with us your commendable experience uh, among the 10 Pacific Island countries in integrating the WGSS in the censuses. Um, the commendable partnership you had with government and other stakeholders, as well as the meaningful engagement of uh, persons with disabilities uh, early on, even from the design stage up to the report writing. So very good experience. Earlier on, we were just talking about uh, um, the possibility, the, the why of why it is important to uh, include it in the survey um, that, and censuses, but uh, for your experience, you have already done so since 2015. Now, uh, let me bring in our fourth speaker. He's, he was also with us on site. Ms. Afke Butzman, heads, Head of Resident Coordinator's Office, Senior Strategic Planner, uh, Office of the United Nations Resident Coordinator for the Republic of Indonesia. Welcome, Ms. Afke. Um, can you please share your experiences in working with the government and other stakeholders to map the availability of disability data and to address data gaps in Indonesia? Thank you very well. Um, good afternoon, Excellencies. Participants, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, today. I'm actually representing the United Nations Resident Coordinator, Valérie Julien um, of Indonesia. She is out of the country, um, but she would have liked to be here, but I will do my best uh, to speak on her behalf. Um, I, I will, uh, to answer this question, I have uh, two, two elements that I would like to share with you. The first is um, that between the government of Indonesia and the United Nations, uh, we have a, um, a cooperation framework uh, on the sustainable development goals um, under which all the activities of the United Nations are included. Um, this is, we are almost at the end of the second year and it's part of the overall UN reform to be more comprehensive in our focus on, um, on the sustainable development goals. What is the added value, at least we see as the added value of the United Nations here in Indonesia, is to have a very strong focus on the leaving no one behind. Um, this includes uh, giving uh, specific um, 
attention to, to people uh, living with a disability. And that is what we have tried to do in uh, our cooperation framework with the government under the four uh, different outcome areas. So um, in order to give more visibility um, to, in this particular case, to, to, to the group of people uh, living with a disability, and it means also in uh, tracking the progress of the implementation of any kind of activity, whether this in the area of environment or uh, innovation on economic transformation, um, we have also made our results framework and our uh, M&E framework uh, much more um, uh, targeted around um, uh, uh, inclusive targets, a baseline that takes into account the status of disability data. Um, and we also have focused on um, a better reporting uh, mechanism. So, by, because this is something that was not the case before. We spoke a lot about, for example, disability, but we did not per se have the tools in place to actually say how are we doing uh, in relation um, to, to this topic of uh, disability inclusion. Uh, we also are training our colleagues because just like me, I am not an expert uh, in the topic of data and disability. And uh, many of the UN colleagues um, are not per se um, experts. We have experts who have it within, let's say, in their terms of reference. But what we try to establish is that regardless which agency you are working for, and not per se the agencies that are dedicated on, uh, let's say, more the social issues, but also other um, issues, are starting to build a capacity on monitoring and evaluation of the UN activities in the area of disability. So we are currently training um, our uh, data and ME officers in, um, in, in m and &E, specifically on the, uh, disability inclusion. Um, and linked to that also a inclusive approach to, to communications. And in this way, we, since we are now on the second year of our cooperation framework, we start to see that the data that we are collecting is much more robust and we are better able to, to report on what the United Nations Indonesia is doing on um, people with, uh, with disability. Um, so this is the, the, the first part that I wanted to share with you. The second part um, is that um, in 2019, the Secretary General, he launched um, a United Nations data strategy because in addition to um, the overall concept of leaving no one behind, he also was stressing um, the importance of working more with data, uh, which sounds very obvious, but we did not have a very systematic approach, uh, again, across all the agencies on, uh, on a data-driven approach, whether it's on our m and &E, on our uh, programming, um, um, and other priorities. So what we have done here in Indonesia is um, uh, we first have um, uh, uh, undertaken a, a data landscape analysis, and we have um, uh, worked specifically on a chapter on disability data. So what is the status of disability data in Indonesia? And um, what, we, what we have seen is that, um, uh, and, and those are just a, a few general findings of the study that we have done and that we are currently trying to address through a UN-wide uh, working group on, on data and M&E. Um, so the first one is, for example, the recommendation to, that, uh, to advocate for improved data dissemination and also just like the first speaker on, on disaggregation of, uh, of data. We are advocating also with the government on the uh, national SDG indicators to become uh, more dis disaggregated. And also for a better sharing of the administrative and, and other data on disability uh, inclusion, and as well as uh, capacity building. The second one, finding that we, um, we, uh, we have uh, observed in the study is the importance of the harmonization of definitions and methodologies uh, with the aim to strengthen accuracy and uh, comparability and uh, specifically on the harmonizing of the data collection and the questionnaires and, and um, et cetera. The, the third uh, finding is related to the, 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 the review and to improve, uh, to review and reprove uh, the disability data collection and the management processes. And also here, uh, the aim is um, 
for more inclusive uh, processes, um, especially on the uh, identification of uh, people with, uh, with disabilities. And the fourth finding that we have uh, identified in the study is um, um, the importance of, of linking um, the decision makers with the available data sets and also trying to improve the different data sets that we uh, have available. So what we see is um, we have different UN agencies working in this field. Um, and just only this year, um, uh, for example, the World Food Programme has worked with, uh, with the government on training um, and utilization of disability data for food security and nutrition. Uh, the UNFPA have worked on uh, the impact on, um, uh, on, on older persons, especially older persons with a disability of uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, UNICEF has been uh, working with the BPS, the Office of Statistics, on uh, piloting a child functioning module and also a landscape analysis of uh, children with disabilities. And uh, we in the Resident Coordinator's Office, because we, we basically work with all the agencies and we are trying to um, introduce harmonized approaches, including uh, on data and data on disabili uh, for disability inclusion, um, we are currently working on a Leaving No One Behind study, um, again with a dedicated component on people with a disability and also trying to identify what the UN can do through our cooperation framework that I mentioned earlier to address um, uh, those gaps in terms of uh, disability data. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Afki. So it's a very good example that you shared about what the UN Resident Coordinator's Office is doing in a partnership with all other UN agencies in Indonesia and also in partnership with the government of Indonesia. I think uh, what you shared with us is a um, clear demonstration of uh, the saying, uh, what gets measured gets done. So by integrating uh, this uh, disability data or focus on disability data in the resource-based management framework and M&E framework, uh, we can get things moving through this uh, uh, disability data. Now, uh, allow us to move to the second round of questions. Um, back to Mr. Mont. Um, I think this is a very good question because uh, earlier we were just uh, talking about the recommendation from the UN resident coordinator on harmonizing uh, statistical and administrative data. So, uh, Mr. Mont, how can governments effectively harmonize statistical and administrative data on disability and maximize the use of data from various sources? Over to you, Mr. Mont. Yeah, this is an, an important question because the disability data is collected in various places within the government, censuses, surveys, but also through administrative data, for example, education management information systems, through um, uh, disability assessments, uh, administrative systems for um, in social welfare um, and health in, in, in various places. And if the data is being collected with different methodologies or different ways in different places, it A, creates confusion because one place says disability prevalence is 3%, someplace else says it's 20%. And it also undermines the um, effectiveness of the data because we can't use the data systems together. Right? We, can't, we can't combine, when we, we're able to combine data systems together, they become more, more powerful. So it's important that we have a harmonized approach to identifying people with disabilities in, in all of these uh, systems. Um, and that means uh, having a core set of questions that are the same in all of these systems so that we can connect them. That doesn't mean that for programmatic purposes, different programs can have different eligibility criteria. For example, maybe one program um, is really designed for, for people with high support needs. So they're going to have a different cutoff for who is eligible for that program. A different program, let's say in a school, wants to address all children who have any level of difficulty learning because, you know, wants to address their needs. So they're, quote unquote, cutoff for determining who has a disability for programmatic purposes might be different. But that doesn't mean that every data source can't have a core set of questions that are the same so that we can understand um, uh, uh, how the people identified in one data source are connected to another. Uh, one example of this um, where they're trying to do this is actually in Rwanda, where they're creating something called a disability management information system, where they're trying to connect 
all of those um, data sets into one management system with, a, with again, with, with the ability to, to uh, have the same uh, questions to identify people's functional difficulties. So they can use that data at the government level to plan uh, and and uh, for pro and develop programs, but they can also use it at the individual level among case managers, so that when someone with a disability um, is 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 uh, enters the system, the the case manager, the caseworker, has full access to to, to all, all all the information from var from various places and can harmonize that together. And a few other countries now are trying to work on harmonizing data. And and actually, um, I co I just co-authored an article. It came out in Health Affairs, um, I think they can share the link to you, that talks about harmonization and uh, between statistical and administrative data and why you want to do it and the advantages of it. So if, if uh, I think they can put the link up to that maybe in the chat and, um, and you can uh, hear a more detailed answer than the one, I, the one I just gave. Thank you very much, Mr. Mon, for that uh, very answer. So uh, putting something as uh, complex as this idea into something that uh, that's uh, quite practical, starting with the core set of questions, is a very good uh, uh, step. And uh, also giving giving us an example from Rwanda. And also we look forward to, to the link to the article that uh, you co-authored. Uh, I'm sure that will be quite helpful for everyone. Now, um, going back to Mr. Yu. Uh, Mr. Yu, what, what can other countries learn from China's experience, uh, for example, in the coordination amongst government agencies, integration of various types of information concerning persons with disabilities? Mr. Yu. Thank you. Uh, really, it's a challenging question, and I would like to try my best to answer the question. Uh, in building a data collection platform, we attach importance especially to the reach of grassroots level channel. When it comes to practice, designated working staff from local disabled persons federations and associations based in villages conduct door-to-door -door service to ensure the accuracy and effectiveness of data. <clears throat> uh, the data is not a solo, but a symphony. Uh, there are at least two features as follows. The first one is it connects with the overall government information platform. We integrate information service platform on disability into the overall government information platform. Certified working staff from disabled persons federations at all levels are able to go through all work related to related procedures, trans provinces, businesses, business included. Very conveniently on the platform which greatly facilitates persons with disabilities to get services. <clears throat> Second, it connects with specific functional government departments. We attach great importance to the intergovernmental collaboration, application of data base included. In China, all levels of governments have set up working committees on disability affairs, which consists of major functional government departments. <clears throat> Disabled Persons Federations of their level is responsible for daily work of the committee. In this way, disability related work can be included into the overall government running database on disability is put into comparison and shared with other related governmental departments in order to ensure the accuracy of information concerning the status of education, social security, assistance and subsidies provided for persons with disabilities. CDPF has formed a sharing and collaborating mechanism with various ministers, such as Ministry of Public Security, 
Ministry of Civil Affairs, Civil Affairs, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Human Resources and Social Security, and the National Rural Revitalization Administration. Under this mechanism, data collected will be shared for multiple uses and serve as scientific evidences for government service supply and policy making. Here, I would like to give you an example. CDPF included the information on working age registered persons with disabilities in the database. By collaborating with Ministry of Education, tailor-made job planning services concerning employment, counseling, career planning, and job opportunity recommendation are designed for them so as to promote high quality employment of students with disabilities. Uh, my last point I'd like to share is when establishing database, <coughs> national conditions, and so, uh, including social structure and the cultural factors shall be taken into consideration. Uh, we cannot simply replicate others format and uh, innovation is especially important. To conclude, China is willing to strengthen exchange and collaboration with Asian and Pacific countries in the field of database construction, so as to enhance our capacity of data collection and administration. We would like to work jointly with the betterment of persons with disabilities in the Asia and the Pacific region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yu, and thank you for sharing what has uh, experienced in terms of ensuring an infrastructure for the database that lends it accuracy and accessibility and at the same time makes it easy for use uh, across levels. Uh, you also highlighted um, uh, an experience where this database was linked to an education uh, service, especially for working age persons with disabilities. And uh, you also highlighted the importance of um, social and cultural factors within the national context to take into consideration for making any uh, database of uh, such kind. And finally, your openness, China's openness to collaborate with uh, other countries in this regard. Um, once again, thank you. Now, uh, back to Mr. Seta. Um, can you please share uh, with us your pioneering work in partnership with governments on enhancing disability inclusion in voluntary national review and SDG tracking, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. Our excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters with disabilities, uh, before I respond to the question, I'd, I'd like to take the opportunity, firstly, to acknowledge the wonderful work of UNSCAP and, 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 and member states in our region. We are celebrating, reflecting, reviewing the third decade. And I, I, my mind goes back to the first decade uh, when, and I hope, I believe some of us probably in this room or are joining online would remember the first uh, decade of 93 in 2002, followed by the Biwako framework in the second decade and other ancient strategy. There was a slogan, I'm not quite sure, in the first decade or second decade, that talks about uh, to be seen, to be heard, and to be counted. And I think that that lies, um, lies within there is, is, is a wonderful message for, for us as persons with disabilities, through our representative organizations, to you, our the partners, including our governments, they call us that, um, that we want to be. We want to be seen, we want to be heard, and of course we want to be counted. And we know that in the, uh, in, the, in, in, our, in, in the 2030 agenda, uh, personal disabilities are mentioned 11 times. And in the SDG itself, there are seven references to uh, personal disabilities. We also know that there are goals and targets that do not reference personal disability. 
Uh, but how have, how have all these goals and targets are implicitly applicable to persons with disabilities because of the inclusive language used in the SDG when they used all men and all women? Or even without that inclusive language, all goals and targets are still applicable to us because of the overarching principle of SDG is to leave no one behind. Since SDG review mechanisms at the national level, through to regional up to uh, the high-level political forums or voluntary national reviews are critical uh, to us in uh, recording, reporting uh, the implementation of, of SDG at the national level, we, Organization of Persons with Disabilities, we must collaborate with governments, civil society, and other stakeholders to ensure our stories are told. They are reported and included in the SDG reports at our national level. And here I want to acknowledge um, uh, the, 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 the Ambassador of Fiji here in, in, um, in Indonesia, Republic of Indonesia, uh, because I heard from him the other day, was it yesterday, that Fiji will be presenting its, um, its, uh, its VNR um, in, I think in the coming year. And uh, there are four things that I've learned uh, that I want to share today. Uh, one is exactly that. We as organizations of persons with disabilities, we need to find out when our country is presenting our VNR, the, best, the, the voluntary national reviews during the high level political forum there in New York. We need to find out those dates, when it's happening. Uh, and then, because when they report uh, during the high level political forum, it's about work done at the national level against the SDG. And therefore, we must, as persons with disabilities in our representative organization, engage in those processes. We must engage, second point, with the civil society organizations and our stakeholders in the national level so that our statements, our issues are included. Remember what I said earlier, you want to be seen, you want to be heard, and also you want to be counted. At the regional level, uh, again, I'm also thankful and acknowledge the presence of um, the, the disability uh, constituency. I'm Mr. Line Romanza South, the co chair of the Disability Forum. And I encourage persons with disabilities here that we join the disability constituency and through to the stakeholder group of persons with disabilities. We want our story told. We want to, to frame and change the narrative. And therefore, we must engage at the um, here in the Asia Pacific, it's what we call the APRSM, the Asia Pacific Regional Civil Society Engagement Mechanism. We have the People's Forum, and thanks to UNSCAP uh, for supporting these meetings prior to the, uh, the, the SDG and prior to the high-level political forum. And then globally, at the national level, I mentioned the stakeholder group of persons with disabilities. Uh, there's yet another process. Uh, that we can uh, uh, participate that I found to be very effective and useful for us as organizations of persons with disabilities, again, to tell our stories. Underlining the slogan that was promoted once by the UNESCAP, we want to be seen, we want to be heard, and we want it to be count counted, therefore you must be involved. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you very much, Mr. Seta. That's a very well said. Very passionate <laughs> uh, sharing of uh, wanting to be seen, to be heard, and to be counted. So the, the message is really to collaborate and engage. Now let me move uh, to Ms. Bootsman. Um, how can the UN system track internal progress towards disability inclusion? And what are some of the actions the Resident Coordinator's Office has taken towards mainstreaming disability inclusion? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I spoke earlier about um, the, the strong commitment on the leaving no one behind. And there is a risk that we always say that as a slogan, and leaving no one behind. Uh, well, this is no longer the case. Um, each of the UN country teams in the world has now an, um, uh, a requirement to complete what we say scorecards. One for youth, one for gender, and one for disability inclusion. 
So on an annual basis, we are expected to uh, report on, on the progress that we make on those three uh, topics. Um, I would like to go and, uh, to, into a little bit more detail on the disability inclusion scorecard uh, today. It's, um, it's, um, it has 14 indicators that are organized by four different areas. The first is on leadership, strategic planning and management. The second on inclusiveness. The third on programming. And the last one on organizational culture. And if I may build on um, the intervention of the previous speaker on, on speak, uh, referring to uh, being seen, being heard, and being counted, um, that is exactly um, what, what we are expected to, to engage in on, around those um, uh, concepts. Because um, too often, um, yeah, we have, we as the United Nations, we have good intentions. Um, but we, want, we, we are expected now to go beyond uh, just those intentions, but that we actually uh, deliver concrete uh, results. And I would like to share with you um, a few of them. Um, one, I already mentioned earlier on, on the data, on what we are currently doing on data and trying to work with the government around data gaps, approaches, methodologies, uh, reporting, etc. cetera. Um, and I also mentioned already the m and &E. But one is, for example, also that we ha are expected to improve the engagement and the partnerships with organizations representing people with disabilities. Um, in, speaking for Indonesia, we have taken steps, um, but we have to do much more. Um, and again, we see agencies that are traditionally working in this field to do this naturally as part of their mandate, but we also see other agencies they um, don't have people, uh, the organizations representing people with disabilities in their natural network of, uh, of partners. And this is what we are currently working on. Uh, a concrete example is that we are rolling out, um, um, uh, we are working currently on, on a database uh, with uh, youth organizations uh, representing uh, young people with a disability. And um, through this inventory, uh, we uh, making that available uh, to both the government and the UN agencies so that when there are consultations, when there are participatory processes for program design, that we know um, immediately who we can contact um, um, in the different provinces, on which SDGs uh, do those organizations work, um, etc. So this is like one, one concrete example. Also, um, we are making our offices more accessible for people uh, with a disability. So like this year, we have done uh, an assessment on actually how people with disability re um, can enter our offices. And, and we have learned that our offices are not per se very accessible. Um, so we are currently doing rehabilitations um, in, in the offices. Uh, we also have trained together with people with a disability, our frontline staff of security, of uh, the reception area, so that it becomes, the, our physical environment becomes more welcoming. We just concluded an ICT baseline assessment uh, to see to what extent are our online tools actually um, um, user-friendly for people with a disability, but also the products that we produce, to what extent can they be accessed online uh, through uh, websites or other type of, uh, of um, written documents for people with a disability. This requires a lot of training. As I mentioned before, many colleagues in the UN system um, are not specialized in this, and they simply uh, yeah, don't have the knowledge. So um, we are also investing in training uh, to make sure that our basic skill sets are uh, being improved uh, when we write documents or we publish on the social media uh, to make this all more inclusive. Um, and the last one that I wish to mention is the one on human resources. Soon we are also rolling out here um, um, a baseline assessment to see what are good practices from one agency to the other and how can we replicate this across uh, the system, working also on uh, what we want to do next year on job fairs and uh, again linking this with organizations uh, representing people with a disability um, and, and, and closing that, uh, that gap. So at the end of the year we we put into, uh, yeah, we basically self-report on the various activities 
and initiatives uh, that we have undertaken. And this is being evaluated by a group um, in, in New York, uh, which is made of uh, colleagues, um, some have um, uh, disability, um, who actually um, um, yeah, come back to us um, and with quite difficult questions. So while this self-reporting, um, it's um, there is a, a strong level of accountability that we are um, being held against. So it's, uh, as I just want to make a final point. It's, it's a huge learning journey. And, um, uh, and I see this as something very positive. A few years ago, this, 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 this simply was, was not happening. This is the third year that we're using this scorecard. And you really see that colleagues become much more engaged. It's no longer a topic that only is um, um, under the responsibility of selected colleagues uh, or, or agencies, but that across um, the U United Nations um, here in Indonesia, it's, it becomes much more um, a topic um, of our day-to-day -day, uh, work, regardless uh, what is your responsibility. So thank you very much for sharing this experience. Thank you very much, Ms. Afki, uh, for sharing uh, with us so many examples of what you have been doing in translating the previous slogan into really something that uh, is concrete by way of scorecards and other initiatives. So this is very um, inspiring for us, especially for me coming from the ASEAN Secretariat. There are some things that are quite inspiring, and we'd love to look into them, how we can possibly um, do some of those as well. So, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of our roundtable discussion. Uh, it has been a great honor for me to moderate this roundtable and learn from our, from our diverse experts on disability data and statistics. I have a lot of takeaways, but I'd like to highlight two that uh, stood out. One, we are not short of opportunities and ways to enhance disability disaggregated data to inform policymaking and programming not only among governments, but also among multilateral agencies, such as the UN. From inclusion of questions on functioning in censuses and surveys, harmonization of administrative data, to using big data. There are existing good practices and evidence from experiences in other countries and contexts. And given the current progress and persistent challenges we face, we can actually do more, provided we have the political will. In this regard, we need meaningful participation of persons with diverse disabilities and their representative organizations in the design, implementation, report writing, and use of disability disaggregated data and statistics, and be mindful of enablers for this and to remove the bar barriers. While duty bearers make available the opportunities and platforms to ensure uh, persons with diverse disabilities participate in the process, it is likewise important for persons with disabilities and their representative organizations to engage, collaborate, and tap these opportunities. It is a two-way street after all. Finally, I am pleased to share that ASEAN did both when it developed the Enabling Master Plan 2025. There was a strong political commitment, meaningful participation of persons with disabilities, and robust mechanisms to implement and monitor and even evaluate. It doesn't mean, though, that ASEAN uh, is done with this. We have a long way to go and to make the rights real for uh, persons with disabilities uh, in ASEAN member states and in the sub-region. At this point, I will uh, now hand it back to the chair. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Ms. Babaran and the panelists for the very informative and inspiring panel discussion. I think I will always remember three questions when making decisions for people with disabilities. Who are they? Where do they live? And what is their life like? It's a takeaway I will take from this. Uh, distinguished delegates, I now invite you to make brief interventions related to the topic of tracking progress towards the achievement of disability inclusive development. Again, in, in the interest of time and allowing as many delegates to speak as possible, I request you to keep your intervention short, not longer than two minutes each. I will first invite delegates who are present in the room to speak, followed by delegates who request to speak online Due to limitation in time, we will maybe not able to guarantee a speaking slot for every delegate who requests to speak. 
We seek your understanding and cooperation. I now invite the first speaker on the list, the distinguished delegate of uh, Turkey, uh, Director General of Services for Persons with Disabilities and the Elderly from the Ministry of Family and Social Services, um, Elmas Estra Sicily. Honorable Chair, distinguished participants, at the beginning I would like to thank to all panelists for their valuable contributions. Uh, to track progress towards achieving disability inclusive development, uh, on December 3rd, 2021, we announced the 2030 Barrier Free Vision document. We plan to monitor the implementations of this document through a three years action plan on the way to becoming an inclusive, egalitarian, and sustainable society where the rights of persons with disabilities are realized. Accordingly, we have reached the final stage in preparation of our three-year plan. With this action plan, which we will announce 2022, December 3rd, we determined actions for developing data and statistics for monitoring policy making and implementation coordinating policy making and monitoring processes with a multilateral and participatory approach in the field of disability. In order to monitor and share the developments in the field of disability and to produce innovative solutions, we established the Monitoring and Evaluation Board for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which includes senior representatives of all public institutions and organizations. In all provinces, we established accessibility monitoring and inspection commissions to monitor and inspect accessible practices in order to increase the participation of persons with disabilities as equal individuals in social life. Within the scope of the project called Supporting the Implementation and Monitoring Capacity of the CRPD, which we have carried out in cooperation with UNDP, we have constructed sectoral-based indicator sets in the areas such as education, health, employment. We continue to monitor our actions through these indicators. We are determined to continue our work with all these efforts for a more inclusive, equitable, and sustainable Turkey that leaves no one behind. Thank you. Thank you. Let me invite the distinguished delegate of Malaysia, Datuk Dr. Mazia Ashi Yusuf, Secretary General, Minister of Women, Family and Community Development. Thank you, Madam Chair, distinguished delegates. A comprehensive data, a comprehensive and disaggregated aggregated data on persons with disabilities is imperative to formulate evidence-based policies and programs. In Malaysia, since 2011, the Information System Management for Persons with Disabilities has been established to facilitate registration process and tabulation of registered persons with disabilities according to category, age group, sex, and location. This year, the Department of Statistics has also initiated data collection of persons with disabilities in Malaysia through the 2022 National Population Census. This information system management for persons with disabilities has been linked to several major administrative databases in the country that relates to social protection programs, such as those under the Ministry of Transport, National Registration Department and Social Security Organizations. Monitoring of progress towards disability inclusive development is being done through the National Council for Persons with Disabilities and its six committees. Progress made in areas such as registration, the universal design and built environment, 
employment, transportation, education, and quality life care is shared to the public through annual progress reports. Improving the existing database for a more consolidated data collection will definitely help for better tracking of progress on disability inclusive development. Thank you. I now invite the distinguished delegate from Pakistan, Mr. Sahzad Khan. Thank you, I'm Chair Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, with regard to the topic uh, of availability of reliable and authentic data about PWD, definitely is one of the major challenge. Efforts were made to collect uh, accurate and reliable data on persons with disability during population and housing census 2017, but it will remain a challenge due to uh, direct questions. Due to social and cultural values, as we know, most of the times families are reluctant to give accurate information about PWDs uh, due to uh, stigma attached with this uh, in some cultural and social setting. And when questioned like this, for example, is there any disabled person in the family? Sometimes families are reluctant to give the true picture. Therefore, drafting of question as well as capacity building of the enumerator is very much important. In this regard, I would like to mention the action plan prepared by Government of Pakistan on implementation of Incheon strategy with the help of the UNSCAP where milestones were set and targets were given for the relevant departments to include commitment for collection of uh, data uh, with regard to person with disability in their upcoming survey. In this regard, Pakistan Bureau of Statistics and Ministry of Health and Regulation committed to collect data on disability th through their survey by using Washington Group of Question. And with the help of this plan and sensitization of the stakeholder, first time data collected through uh, conducted by Pakistan Bureau of Statistics and Ministry of Health and regulation. Their survey, their Pakistan Health and Demographic Survey, Pakistan Social and Living Standard Measurement, and Pakistan Labor Force Survey uh, provided uh, first time data on uh, disability by using Washington Group of Question. And we are expecting that in the upcoming population and housing census, uh, the Pakistan Bureau of Statistics will also make efforts to collect data on disability by using uh, indirect question given under uh, Washington Group of Question. Because this is the reliable source to collect data by uh, using indirect question. And if we conclude uh, the significance of the data collection in this regard, there are three main areas. Number one, sensitization and awareness raising. Number two, framing of questions uh, in the questionnaire for collection of relevant data. And the third and the most important is the capacity building of the stakeholder. Thank you. Thank you. I may now call upon a distinguished delegate from Cambodia. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for giving opportunity to Cambodia delegation. Uh, I just want to inform, to make information about the CBIT inclusive uh, community-based inclusive development in Cambodia in 2000, 2003, 2023. Uh, this, uh, usually, uh, this CBIT, the uh, work doing, uh, did, did uh, during four times. The first time in, th in Thailand, in 2009, and the second time in uh, Philippines, and third time in, in uh, Japan, and fourth time in Mongolia. And this time is the, first, uh, the fifth time in Cambodia. So uh, this occasion, I would like to invite you all to participate in uh, this Congress, this the big Congress. Uh, this Congress is under the, uh, the, under the subject, the, 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 subject the, the theme of uh, sanctioning social and economic empowerment of persons with disability during and after the COVID-19 pandemic through community-based inclusive development. We have this, we have this because we want to improve after COVID-19. So after this, I would like to invite you all to participate in, to join in our Congress as a, a, a first a fifth number five of uh, Cambodia. Uh, he is the host of the Congress. Thank you very much. I hope I see you all at, at uh, 20, 2023. Thank you. Thank you. 
Let me now invite the distinguished dis, dis, um, delegate from Rehabilitation International Republic of Korea, Ms. Rina Lee. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> the significance of data collection has been well shared through a number of talks in this meeting. In this regard, we thank the ESCA for actually taking an initiative in supporting the member states on building disability disaggregated data collection to develop disability inclusive policies and provisions. We CSOs highly recommend the, this valuable work to be continued for the next decade. Uh, as a panelist mentioned, actually some countries have started a national survey through the application of the Washington questionnaire aligned with the SDG. However, many respondents, especially those who are living in a remote areas with less education, have had difficulties in understanding survey. The government should facilitate the use of the survey in person so that our region is able to collect reliable data considering the large gap between the average prevalence of disability reported from the Asia and the Pacific region compared, compared with the worldwide prevalence of 15 percentage reported. Both the government and the ASCA shall continue to establish reliable and disability disaggregated data to ensure an inclusive and equitable society. In order to mainstreaming disability rights, it is also significant for disability groups to be engaged in the major group and other stakeholder mechanism on SDG, from the stage of establishing national targets and goals to monitoring and the reporting process. Through the process, I think we can make disability-specific targets and disability indicators, and also we can mainstream disability rights in other colleagues in the different sectors as well as in other ministries. And we know that disability rights should be recognized as a cross-cutting issue by all stakeholders, just as with their gender rights and the environmental issues. In line with the UN Disability Inclusion Strategy, the member states, especially ODA donor countries, shall enact or amend the international development law and the guidance accordingly to accelerate disability inclusive development and shall provide the training of trainers on disability inclusion, including all ministries on a sub-national level. We recommend uh, engaging OPDs in the process of planning and evaluation on projects in the development sectors to monitor compliance of UN and national guidelines, to promote both disability-specific projects and to ensure general ODA projects are uh, disability-inclusive. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We strongly recommend the ASCAP to reactivate a multi-trust fund with a particular emphasis on involving the private sector. Thank you. Thank you. Let me now invite the distinguished delegate from DPI Asia Pacific, Mr. Sattar. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you all participant and uh, our our respectable uh, um, government representative and the SCAP, uh, our staff uh, people in work in this cap. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, everything, whatever development and whatever we discussed yesterday and today, all this depend on partnership of the organization of persons with disabilities and the leadership of persons with disabilities. As women do not have their organization 20 years back, and today women rights will be different. They are not have the right today. So that and similarly, the organization of a person with disabilities is very important for our sustainable development of nation with that needed and we are dreaming a resilient society. And what is the OPD? I want to say that it is a fundamental organization of personal disabilities. It should fully 
governed and led by themselves or their representative with disabilities. It ensures safeguard of their ownership, effective representation, non-influence decision with democratic practice, and recognition of DPO OPDs. It is not that ordinary uh, CSO or NGOs. So this organization uh, need uh, to be harmonized through the national budget uh, with partnership and should ensure the participation, their participation, we at the all stakeholders even that government do organize planning meeting, planning workshop, they uh, formulate policy in such type of event, the OPD's effective representative should take place. So in this regard, I recommend, and I also want to request the SCAP should help the nation to standardize the details terminology. Details should come up with the list of disability and the definition of OPDs. Who is the OPDs with explanation? And I also want to say that as we're talking, we are looking for a data. So we need the data, and that's why I want to recommend also a scab. Thank you, Mr. Sattar. Yes, I'm 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 finishing. And my last point to accelerate the implementation of internal strategy, donor development partner should encourage to be committed to building partnership with OPD. As we know, under our SCAP region, many countries somewhat depend on donor support. As we Thank see, you. The, most of the donor not really okay. engaged uh, in this field. Thank you very much, Madam Sir. Thank you and apologies. Um, yeah, let me now invite the distinguished delegate from Japan. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I'm sorry to say that um, I'm now just preparing and uh, please give us a time. Thank you. Um, it is, with sincere apologies, this agenda item is finishing and we may not have the time. Let me continue with the agenda item. In addition to the request from Japan, I see no more speakers on the list. I would like Madam to Chair, thank the moderator. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, can I intervene from Japan? Please do. Thank you so much for a belated statement. Uh, thank you very much for giving me a floor. Um, my statement is very brief. Japan actively participated in the negotiation of the Convention on the Right of Persons with Disability in the drafting stage and signed the convention in 2007. And uh, um, after the revision of the basic act for persons with disability were developed and uh, other necessary legal arrangements, in February 2014, Japan ratified the convention. Japan submitted a national report to the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disability in 2016 in accordance with Article 35 of the Convention. This reflects discussion at the Committee on Policy for Persons with Disability, which is responsible for promoting and monitoring the implementation of the Convention in Japan and protecting the rights of persons with disability and public comment. In last August, the Committee on, on the Rights of Persons with Disability reviewed a report of the Government of Japan, and some positive aspects were pointed out, including information accessibility, elimination of discrimination, barrier-free development, and promotion of employment were cited as positive aspects. The views and the recommendations from the committee will be fully examined by the relevant Japanese ministries and agency right now. Thank you so much. So very much. As I see no more speakers in the list, let me take the opportunity to once again thank the moderator, the panelists, and the delegates for the lively discussion. 
Um, the meeting has now concluded the deliberations on round table four. Be yeah. Before we conclude, it is my pleasure to report on behalf of the Bureau on the status of the credentials of representatives of members to the high level intergovernment on the final review of the Asian Pacific Decade of Persons with Disabilities, 2013 to 2022. In accordance with Rule 12 of the Rules of the Procedure of the Commission, the Bureau noted that credentials have been received by a total of 37 member states and found them to be in order. Thank you. Tomorrow we shall reconvene at 14.30 hours Jakarta time to continue our deliberations on agenda item four, adoption of the report on the meeting and the outcome document under which we will consider with the aim to adopt the outcome document entitled Jakarta Declaration on the Asian and Pacific Decade of Persons with Disabilities 2023 to 2032 and the meeting report. Before this meeting is adjourned, I would like to invite the Secretary to provide some housekeeping announcements. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to make three important announcements. Firstly, on behalf of the Ministry of Social Affairs of Indonesia, I'd like to inform all delegates that Her Excellency Ibu Tri Rismaharini, Minister of Social Affairs, will host a gala dinner at the Ministry Headquarters this evening. All delegates are invited to join the gala dinner. Shuttle buses have been arranged to depart from the Fairmont Hotel from 5.30 p.m. onwards. Please consult the registration counter for more information about the gala dinner arrangement, which I had briefed you in the morning, and I'm sure it's going to be one of the, uh, an excellent experience. Secondly, the Ministry of Social Affairs has also arranged a field visit to the Center of Excellence, Centra Tarpadu Intensuveno, tomorrow, tomorrow morning. The center provides excellent support and services to persons with disabilities. All delegates are encouraged to join the field visit. The shuttle buses have been arranged to depart from the Fairmont Hotel and the three satellite hotels listed in the information note at 7.30 a.m. If you wish to join the field visit, please sign up at the registration counter if you have not already done so. Last but not least, tomorrow they are from 13 to 14.10, that is from 1 o'clock to 2.10, there'll be another three side events held in parallel, including two in hybrid modality and one online. The two hybrid events will be held in the ballroom three on the ground floor, which is next door, and the jade room on the second floor. For more information about these side events, including ways to join, you may visit the meeting website by scanning the QR code that is displayed on the screens, and I hope it will be displayed soon, or consult a liaison officer for this purpose. Now, as for the report, and I'm sure that is one of the urgent things on your mind, the report will be available in all SCAP languages, and which is mainly only a procedural report and the uh, outcome document by 12 noon. And uh, I think uh, that will give adequate time for all delegates to have a look before the session for adoption is taken up at 2.30. The meeting will resume at 2.30 p.m. Tomorrow, tomorrow and please make sure you return to the meeting in the same plenary room on time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. The meeting is adjourned. Recording stopped.